Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Mellow Jams and Tea Podcast Where we spin the jams and spill the tea But in like Hello, a really boy. chill way You know? Just just hanging. And today we're talking about some bands that like, you know, you might have heard of and you know, like maybe we've mentioned like once or twice, uh, you know, um, like, I don't know, maybe Tyler has a specific affinity for them for some reason. I don't know why. Well, I don't know uh, where but, you would get that from at all. But yeah, I mean, we're covering the new album by acclaimed British progressive pop <laughs> and <laughs> everything everything i like that you made that exact same joke during the introduction to the b-sides on everything everything oh god i want a deep throat a revolver and we're also covering the new release by the flaming lips american head and in today's uh well later video we are going to be covering tyler's recommended album this week which is english settlement by xtc yes so make and sure you go and check out that video once my favorite twitch streamer <laughs> What God. logic? <laughs> <laughs> this is already you say a that like we, disaster. We, you say that like we know what Twitch is. Like, also, um, by my I book, don't know it's what pretty. Twitch is. I'm just guessing. I, I bought I bought that. You did buy it. my book. Thank you. Thank and you. I bought okay, that edition gamers. of it. It's nice. Let's go, gamers. What have we been listening to this week, gamers? Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll start off. Every, for for we we may have some new viewers this week. Um, so yeah, we start off every episode by talking, going around and talking about uh, other unrelated records that we've listened to this week that we think are worth a mention. Um, mm-hmm. and then we'll get into the main new releases for the week. So yep. Jake, you go first. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to just preemptively uh, apologize. I have had a very rough day today, so if I sound a little bit out of it, listeners. I do apologize, but uh, I passed out and went to the ER today. So, you know, it's been fun. It's great. Good times. Been he has a clap. Up. Yep, that's <laughs> it. That's, yep. God, if only I had a disease that actually came from having contact with another human being. Thank you to So the, this week I've thank been you listening. To the you could easily attain that. Thank you to the medical professionals who reanimated Jake's American head. <laughs> No English That's... settlement. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. It's going to be Thank a great you. one. Okay. Uh, this week, uh, I will start off by shouting out a record that came out of nowhere. And uh, I'm going to shout out my mutual on Twitter that recommended it to me uh, through the song, uh, A Better Son or Daughter. Uh, the band in question being Rilo Kylie, which is an indie rock band. Kind and they right. have an album called The Execution of All Things, and that album is stellar. Please go give that a listen. It's great. I've spun it multiple times. Very soulful, kind of punky, uh, female lead vocals. That'll j- and it's it's just it's just my shit. It's it's quite good. Um, I have listened. I went back and revisited. Uh, two albums by one of my favorite bands that I just haven't listened to all year for some fucking stupid reason. Uh, And I revisited my two favorites from them, which are Black Sabbath's Master of Reality and Heaven and Hell, their two best albums. Uh, And uh, yeah, I mean, shock of all shocks, the most like influential metal band of all times, two best records. I I like them. What? Insane. Um, uh, I, I slightly prefer Ozzy Sabbath. Um, don't at me, but I still love Dio. Um, can't really tell you which one I prefer. They're both great. Go listen to Master of Reality if you want some really good like proto doom metal. And uh, Heaven and Hell's just really fucking fun. Just super good. Neon Knights, best Black Sabbath song. Uh, other than that, I listened to George Harrison's all things must pass uh and again shocking but that album is amazing uh it's almost two hours long we were under the misconception that it's a triple album it's actually a double album it's just apple music on their only 
like or streaming or like whatever whoever owns the fucking Beatles music the only version available to stream is one like plotted with a bunch of fucking bullshit like but like the five songs at the end aren't on the original album and there's like four different things in the middle of it that are just different versions of the same song go listen to that album uh, it's it's better than every Beatles record Uh, I also listened to a whole lot of, uh, Deftones. Wonder why? For reasons. Yes, um, please keep your eye out. Um, subscribe if you're not already, because something, if you're a Deftones fan, then you're going to be very interested to see something that we've been working Mm -hmm. on. Yes, exactly. And that's on that note, the last thing I'll mention is uh, something that is also for the podcast that I've been listening to quite a bit a Frightened Rabbit lately, um, you know, for reasons. And uh, yeah, Painting of a Panic Attack, best album I've ever heard in my life, makes me cry. Uh, I love it. I, I scream the lyrics to it. It's good. That's me. All right. So this is me now. What I've listened to. Uh... First off, I uh, listened to this uh, album from a Norwegian group called Halung, an album called Further. Oh, I love that album. Oh, you do? Yeah. Nice. I love it too. It's free. It's like this 80 minute epic of just pummeling dark folk with like ritual chants. Yeah, I was seriously going to recommend it to you if you hadn't heard it. But no, it seems... it's, I, I, I think I took that recommendation from like Crash Thompson or something and I just mm-hmm. listened to that and it fucking rules. It's oh, great. Gosh. I'm glad P- pummeling, to know we're on the same pummeling, thing, but... pummeling folk with, with chanting. What's, what's this called? Uh, it is called Further, or like Father, F-U-T-H-A by a band called Halo. Okay, because that and the sounds band like... I believe is H E I L U N G something like that. Entire shit is what that sounds I... like. Super good. If you are into like black metal adjacent stuff, that is for yeah. you. I would concur. Next thing I listened to was uh, "Deja Entendu" by Brand New. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> Which uh, I thought it was uh, pretty great. It's just. You know? Are you, fuck, uh, are you fucking... Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. It, it's the quiet thing that no one ever... Anyways, knows. moving swiftly <laughs> along from that. Uh, <laughs> see, I, I set that around. up for a reason. Uh, it's Yeah, it's just really good. I know you've all heard it. Yeah, so I long. listened to science fiction this week, too, so gang, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I won't us. go into detail about why it's good, because you all know why it's good. Uh, Autekker, draft 7.30, or uh, yes. as I think of, I, uh, yeah, my favorite Autekker album so far, I uh, really adore it. It's uh, very murky, grimy, disgusting sounding, but it's got a, it's very playful, very energetic. And uh, I, yeah, it's just my favorite thing they've done. Uh, John Coltrane's Giant Steps was another essential jazz listen for me because I've been going through jazz. It's, it's pretty killer. I mean, uh, we've, we've made this point before, but it's giant steps. I mean, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? It's an amazing album. Uh, last thing I listened to this week was uh, "Full Collapse" by Thursday, which oh. I thought was uh, also fantastic. Uh, there, it's really good. I just randomly heard "Understanding in a Car Crash" after we did the podcast. Like, completely unrelated to Tyler mentioning it. And I, I listened to the whole thing, and it was like, wow, this is very exceptional. That's such a pleasant surprise, because that's not an album I would have ever kind of thought to recommend to you. So it is, it's always nice getting pleasantly surprised like that. 
Yeah, potential new mm. viewers, you must know, August emphatically loving albums that the rest of this podcast really likes, <laughs> not a common occurrence. So this this is a moment to be treasured. Oh, really. by the way, um, my order for the 60th anniversary re-release of Giant Steps arrived today. Oh, sick. Hey, That's nifty. awesome. Yeah. I know that whole thing. Uh, I know the 60th uh, anniversary edition is also available on, like, uh, streaming platforms, mm-hmm. so... Go listen to that. To download that one if you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that was my week. Although Morgan isn't here at the moment, oh, he's he's returning. he just has Doug. Doug. <gasps> he's Doug. Big bastard he tries to steal my pizza. Slice. Show me the baby. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see the baby. <laughs> oh, it's a baby. I mean, oh. Somebody else right. go so I can finish eating. <laughs> yeah, Sersha, why don't you go first? Uh, that's, that's fine. Um, I also listened to John Coltrane this week. I love Supreme, um, which I thought was outstandingly amazing. Probably my favorite John Coltrane record I've heard so far. I've heard like four. Good um, take. Thank you. Um, just so Hot chaotic, take. but also beautiful. The drumming is crazy. But it works so well. Um, just what he's doing on the ride symbol, like he's trying, like the ride symbol just ran off with his wife. Um, but it's just very, very good. Um, everything else I listen to is really prep for podcast. Um, lots of fucking rabbit. Um, lots of frame, flaming lips. But I want to highlight embryonic, which is my favorite of what I've listened to so far. Um, I listened Bucks. to the last. Napalm Death record, Apex Predator Easy Meat, which was critically acclaimed when it was released in 2015. I don't think it's like that great, but I think it's pretty great if you like that kind of thing, which I do. I don't think it's um, that great, but I think it's pretty great. <laughs> hey, you bad <pedantic> bastard. <laughs> well, I, I think it's pretty great if you like that kind of thing. Um, and I also re-listened to A Fever Dream, which, spoilers, is still my favorite Everything Everything record. As it should be. Um, and that that was me. Excellent. Jake Excellent. Morgan's still eating. Do you want to yeah, oh, no, I can, uh, I can go? Yeah, I can go next. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So, yeah, I listened to a few new things in the last week um, that mm-hmm. I want to shout out. Um. The first thing I want to shout out, uh, very special, and I'm surprised it has not been shouted out yet, is that actually one of our own has released new music uh, yes. in the past seven days. Um, and that is of last course, week, you bitch. And that is, of course, um, Sersha, whose uh, new EP, Gender Dysphoria, is... Um, She's only released two EPs yet, um, but I think this is uh, comfortably the best of the two, and I like the Thank first you. one. Uh, it's a it's a very good new EP. Uh, it's um, I think only four songs, um, and in particular, I want to shout out the song uh, "Skin Tight Body Suit," which is um, the best song that Sersha has written to date, and uh, is genuinely uh, a capital G great piece of music that I absolutely adore. Um, legitimately great you. folk song yeah so and the other songs and us, the other songs are good yeah. too but that one is like wow i was knocked out when i heard it oh yeah can, can i share an aspect of the recording of that um with you guys no. <laughs> <laughs> on this music podcast not allowed um the guitar solo and pretty much every electric guitar line was recorded um with my acoustic guitar straight into my laptop's onboard microphone and then was put through an electric guitar filter on garage band Oh my god! Wow. Yeah, it sounded really good. Um, yeah, uh, Gar- uh, Garage Band, very underrated resource in the sense mm. that people shit on it, and you can actually yeah. do good like, stuff with it. D- don't, yeah. It's so stupid being like elitist in terms of like stuff that is can the, be useful. The last Freddie Gibbs album with fucking Mad Lib was made on a fucking iPad. Yeah, like, it's, it's, yeah. You got, GarageBand sucks. You gotta spend a thousand dollars on Pro Tools. You <laughs> wow, it's actually uncanny, Morgan, how, how convincing that was. I've, it's because <laughs> I heard it. Yeah. Um, but yes. And equally hates it. 
anyway, um, please go to um, the Bandcamp Uncamp. page of Sersha and the Agenda. <clears throat> and, and it's linked in the description of our yeah. podcast episodes every single week. So check yes. it out. Please yes, check it, it out. It's, it's only a team episodes I'm not on. It's only a 10 minute EP and it's really good and it deserves your time. Um, Thank you so much. Also, also I maintain it is probably the most personal thing I will ever make. I can't see it getting more uh, painful. (laughs) So I I, I want to also inform you, Sersha, that uh, you may not realize this, but you are almost entirely silhouetted. For God's sake. Um, I I do realize that. (laughs) <laughs> I'm recording outside today. Alexa, ah, play "By Tour the Snow Dog" by F- Rush. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> just just checking. Okay, so what else I listened to? Um, another thing I listened to that I want to shout out is I listened to Dream Theaters, Images and Words. Ah, um, yes. Dream Theater, of course. If you know anything about them, you know that they are a bombastic, um, very colorful very charismatic and energetic band um your mileage may vary uh this yeah. is my <laughs> this is my first dream theater album and i really dug it i thought it was very good uh it's excess in all the right ways it's, it has the excess of a lot of those um late 80s early 90s um sort of hard rock proggy bands that were kind of doing it in that vein um this may sound blasphemous, but parts of it reminded me of, of Guns N' Roses' Use Your Illusion. Uh, although I think this is a better album than that, comfortably. Uh, you better. Uh, but, but, but it <laughs> has the same kind of... this? It has the same what kind you? of freewheeling spirit. <laughs> God, that, that, that dog is huge. Yeah. Large boy. Uh, I else is huge? No. Um... The score I gave you album, the epic. Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, also, listened to this week. Um, actually, probably uh, my favorite thing I heard this week. Oh, actually, no. There were two things that I both gave very, very high ratings that I want to shout out. One is uh, Matt Moss, uh, their album Ultimate Care Two. So I'm building my way up to their new three-hour collab album. Um, but I re- I listened to. Um, Ultimate Care 2, which is the album they made purely by sampling the sounds of a washing machine. Uh, it's one 40-minute track, and it absolutely rules. Um, it's incredibly inventive, creative. It's shifting. It's uh, constantly engaging, and it has like the most ferociously fantastic climax ever um, that you would ever expect to be created with the sounds of a washing machine. Um, and so I strongly recommend it. Uh, even if you're not, I wasn't, I wasn't, I did not chortle at anything you said. He's just, he's trying to catch a fly now. Uh, even if you're <laughs> so not you chortled super... when he said climax and I was just like, really? No. <laughs> <laughs> even if you're not <laughs> hilarious electronic music, I think there's a strong chance you would probably dig that. Um, and the other record that was a real standout of my week was uh, Anna von Housewolf's Dead Magic, which I know Morgan also listened to and is probably going to mention. Um, so I'll just keep it brief and say it's a great album. Um, and the last track sounds like what I imagine you would hear if you finally managed to arrive at the White Lodge in Twin Peaks. Um, it's very Twin Peaksy at the end there, but it's also there's a lot of other influences and sounds all over the record. It's amazing. Um, yeah, good shit. Uh, I also listened to um, my first Wolves in the Throne Room album. Ooh. Two Hunters, uh, another, yeah, great. another great uh, a band that I've been meaning to get into for literal years. Um, unsurprisingly, I dug this. I dug the shit out of this album. I thought it was really good, really cool, inventive, and um, emotive black metal. Uh, I look forward to listening to more of this stuff. Um, be a great double bill with Dead Magic. Yeah, it, yeah, actually, it would be. I think. I think Anna von Hauswolf was on their most recent album. I don't know that for certain, but I think I read that. In, entirely nice woven entirely plausible i think um yeah jake you probably really dig anna von house wolf just being a chelsea wolf fan I, I i was actually going to listen to dead magic today but you know yeah. then i uh collapsed life Oops. happened <laughs> um yeah and i think i'll just leave it there for this week a full collapse one might say 
You, you have two Anna von Hauswolves inside you. Both are sad. Both are gay. <laughs> both suck. Hell yes. Anyway. Um, so I only listened to four albums this week. Um, fairly slow week, and I wanted to properly dig into what we're covering on today's episodes. So just four. Uh, I'll just go ahead and start with Dead Magic. Um, I, it's been <clears throat> a while that I've had a first listen that's like, I, I could see this going into my favorites ever. Uh, like, I, yeah, it's been a, a months now since that happened, and this is the first time in a while. Just do me folky Swedish nightmare madness, and it's fantastic. I thought you said just do me. <laughs> well, that too. I was like, "Whoa, where, where's, where's Morgan going with this exactly?" But yeah, no, I agree. It is, it is do me. Uh, I also listened to uh, more Dream Theater. Surprise! <laughs> um, I listened to Falling Into Infinity, which was the album. Uh, directly after Awake and uh, right before Metropolis Part 2. And it is mid. Very mid. Um, oh, this, no. is, this is far less of a hot take than it would be for saying Awake is mid. Uh, nobody really likes this album. It's not hard to see why. It's just not very interesting. And that's, I, I don't have anything to say about it. That's but, the T. Uh, listen to my first uh, uh, LCD sound system album in full. Heard nice. he- heaps of their stuff before, just single songs, but uh, listen to This Is Happening. And uh, again, w- was getting the feeling that this would be one of the first albums in a while that could potentially become a favorite until we get to pow pow and somebody's calling me, which yeah, is they are weak points, uh, but still very strong, mm-hmm. very strong eight, possibly a light nine. Those I songs think, um, like LCD sound system. I love you, but you're bringing your rating down. Morgan, I think you might be like me and, and end up preferring, uh, their more controversial 2017 album, American Dream, which every some, sing, every song I've heard from that album is excellent. So yeah, I, I uh, everyone says this is happening is better, but I've always felt that American Dream is is their maybe their best album. Um, but they a super Tyler take. You yeah. shut up, please. <laughs> well, it's just that Sound of Silver and This Is Happening have really, really like stratospheric highs, but they also have some mm. songs in the second half that I'm just not as keen on, whereas American Dream is just really consistent the whole way through. How, how, how do you feel about the first album? It's good. It's, it's a bit scattershot, but it's good. Out of the, again, uh, highs are just out of this world. It's good. Like, so like 100 minutes long, so I have yeah. to mm. do it myself. They're still kind of finding their sound on the first one, I think. Hmm. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I last thing I listened to was uh, an album by Bar- like, like Baroque pop singer songwriter Julia Holter. Yeah, that's the one. Because um, <clears throat> you looked at my music board, get a get a cookie. Um, Please give me. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, listen to uh, Have You In My Wilderness by Julia Holter. Um, yeah, it's really, really good. Really so good. Just just <sighs> the most sublime stuff I've heard in a long time. Check out Aviary, oh. too. It's, like it's if, really good. It's like if, it's, uh, it sounds like if, if, if Beach Boys were like hot <laughs> if the beach boys were the dreaming era kate bush yeah mm. yeah oh yeah. oh i would say oh. more like um the sensual world era kate bush but that's just me being a kate bush snob I haven't heard it 
Halter? I don't even know her. Uh, and I've been meaning to listen to Avery since it came out, but it's like 90 minutes long. Yeah. It's all good, though. It's a great record. No, I'm, I'm sure record. it will be. And I can't wait for the day I finally do it. Yeah, that's, that's all I have. Okay. Um, well, then, who's first? Right. Well, with everything, well, everything to who's, Just who's first? We're not going to introduce the album in context. We're not like introducing <laughs> albums. No, I just, I didn't know which, which one album is first. first I mean. No, I know. Oh, right, right, we were right, taking right. the first. Oh, okay. Well, I knew anyway. Apparently, so, you, you all sh- missed it. Okay. So, uh, here's what I would like to do. Um, so, everything, everything is up first. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay, uh, and I think we should just go in jam and tea order for this. Oh, and I'll go okay. last because I've got I'm, and I don't suspect that this will be difficult to call, but I think I have the most to say. Um, yeah, may, I may be wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> we have props. That, Is this that, the first time I've done this for a new album? That's interesting. I didn't, think so. Didn't I? Oh, awesome. You know, I'm not gonna spoil what Tyler said about this album. I, I Ooh, was not expecting. Eh? That's oh. oh, that's hot. Wow. Carry on. Well, I, I certainly well, now am looking forward to hearing what Morgan has to say. But I think yeah. let's. Um, I think we'll have a, from what I both gather about what you guys think of the record and also what I suspect you might some of you might think based on what i've heard i think that just our traditional order will be a good one um uh but i'll give some context before you launch into it so not that i'm sure most of the people watching are familiar with everything everything unless you've come for the flaming lips in which case good for you um (laughs) all six of you um well no flaming lips are, are just I'm just oh, no, totally. They're a bigger band than Everything Everything, so it mm-hmm. wouldn't be surprising if people had come for them. Anyway, uh, so Everything Everything are a four-piece arch pop slash prog pop slash indie pop band, I believe Manchester-based. Um, mm-hmm. This is their, so Reanimator is their fifth album following 2017's uh, acclaimed and Mercury Prize nominated A Fever Dream, uh, which is a particular podcast favorite. If you watched our, we did a full video on the four albums to date of uh, Everything Everything a couple months ago, which you can go and watch um, on our channel. It's very easy to find and it's very good and it's very long, but if you're into the band, <laughs> then you will probably get a lot out of it. It will help inform you as to where we're coming from. Yeah. Where it's, it's featured on the Genius page of one of the songs. <laughs> really? It, yes, this is a true fact. That, which that, song? That, oh. that, it's, it's the one with the treadmill Don Quixote thing. <laughs> okay. Wow. No, it um, really is. That's, no, I'm as good. That, that just sounds like an everything, everything thing. Um, Which song is that again? That's Torso of the Week. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, uh, it's Jack from Torso Art. of the Week's genius page. I'm, I'm going to sure do that now. Yeah. That's, uh, I know exactly who put that there as well, uh, and I'm going to shout them out <laughs> in my review. Um, nice. Um, but yeah, nice. so... I think it's fairly safe to say that to varying degrees, we're all fans of the band. Um, uh, And so we're coming at this from the perspective of uh, by and large, enjoying their previous stuff. August likes two of their previous (laughs) records. That's still enough. Um, Yeah. uh, So we'll see how this goes. I like three. Okay. I like three. Okay, cool. Uh, Mark is good. You're still a fucking loser. (laughs) Well, uh, yeah, but I guess we'll see how this goes. So, um, yeah, I think I mean I'm going to get into some of the some more of the context in terms of what the album was about when I'll get into my review. So I'll save that for that. But um, but yeah, that just so that you all know that we're coming at this from an informed um, perspective. Uh, And Jake, why don't you go first? I will, for the most part, here cast aside some of my more thematic and conceptual observations about this record because if I went ahead and did that I can't help but think that a lot of what Tyler has to say would be rendered redundant but also would render my piece redundant because there's no way I'm going to have as much in depth to say as you do um so well, I'll tell you what said, before you launch into it when I do kind of get into the album because I'm basically going to dissect this fucker uh, if you have anything to say that is different to my interpretations or my feelings, please make that heard. Fair, fair enough. 
Um, You're going to be here for three hours, boys. I I really like every single album they've made thus far, and for varying different reasons, just because I think they're a very interesting, eclectic group of musicians who are constantly shifting their sound, and like, I don't even think everything, everything technically have what I would deem to be a traditional, like, band sound, because they exist in such a weird, fluid state of, like, genre bending, and just, like, higher concept ideas, lots of postmodernist shit, but, like, the reason that that doesn't, like, over-encumber them is because their songs are bops, so, you know, it's like, eh, you know, so I approached this having next to no familiarity with the singles i listened to like a little bit of in bird song but i was just like okay uh, i want to save this for like the holistic thing because there's always something broad and conceptual being done on an everything everything album and you just don't really like get that from listening to singles um and i think that this occupies a very interesting space in their discography because like each of them, while definitely existing in that weird fluid state I mentioned, definitely have, like, this is everything, everything's blank album. Like, Get to Heaven, more or less what I would call their pop album. Fever Dream is a little bit more vibey. It's just kind of inherently more of a, a moody, sort of atmospheric kind of thing, even if it does also have bops. And there's Man Alive, which is a bit more, like, raucous and just sort of unwieldy and arc which is kind of them refining their sounds to ultimately get to where they were going later and this to me anyway reminds me the most of man alive in how kind of i guess it is a bit ramshackle but it's more polished than man alive even if the appeal here is really that this is like everything everything's garage rock album even though it's it's not garage rock but it's an apt comparison um i i can understand why this album would be off-putting to many the production is messy and even cluttered at times the it's it doesn't really have many songs that are even half as immediate as the stuff on get to heaven or even the first few tracks of the fever dream so i understand why this is somewhat divisive uh that said i love it i think it's really damn good uh i'd say that it's maybe one of their most consistent listens just because even with the two records of theirs that i love get to heaven and a fever dream uh, there's always, like, one specific, like, lull that, like, keeps it from true perfection. This album, while I wouldn't say it's perfect and doesn't reach the highs that those albums do, it never really dips. I always am, like, I am always engaged. And that's what makes this kind of special. I think, like, Lost Powers comes out and it's just, like, an instant, okay, this is what the album's mostly going to sound mm -hmm. like. But then you get some real curveballs. You get Big Climb, which is this just genuinely bizarre song where it just like, I believe I saw someone in your mentions, Tyler, comparing the vocal delivery to that of Adam Levine. And uh, I, I'm not gonna lie, I hate that that comparison was made and all it stands for, but it does slightly like, I'll listen to it and just be like, oh God, they, they do have the same falsetto, son of a bitch. Uh, luckily though, the song is great and well-structured. Uh, and it also does have lots of shades of the more vibey shit on A Fever Dream, which you'll know that I liked. You have something like Planets, which is this huge and expansive and kind of like sparkling song that like it lives up to its title in many ways. And Moonlight, which is super just absolutely gorgeous sounding song. And then like that little lull, like you sort of get the opening couple tracks, which are immediate and then you sort of have that lull, and then it goes right back into it with Arch Enemy, which is one of the best songs on the album. It's the guitars on this absolutely fucking rip. It's got some of those memorable and weird and whacked out lyrics. I genuinely do not know what he is talking about on this album, but when the first line is dinosaur, I don't give a fuck. Uh, and then Lord of the Trapdoor, which is maybe the pick I will say for the most underrated song on this album, because I've heard nobody talk about it. Uh, it is fantastic and sort of does a, a, a subtle shift into the final leg of the record, where you have Black Hyena, which is a really like, it's, it's a very dark sounding song. It definitely wouldn't be out of place on the last album. 
uh, and it's sort of, I think Black Hain is where you get the lyric drop of the, the title in this. Is that the one that that mm-hmm. happens in? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Black Hyena, admittedly, is probably my least favorite song, but least favorite by only on um, the merit of all the other songs are just better. Um, I do like the sort of, like, I like the slight repetition in the chorus. I think that's really cool. Um, and then you have In Bird's Song, my favorite song on the record. Uh, another Moonlight-esque song because it's gorgeous. Uh, This is maybe the most beautiful sounding song they have put together yet, uh, and I I love it to death. Uh, And then you have The Actor and Violent Son, which I think sort of really encapsulate the album as a whole. You have The Actor, which is a very dark but not dark sounding song about a, like, a dissociation with personal identity and and consciousness. And it's a really haunting song. Like a lot of the content on this is very grim, but also underlined with like the weird abstract humor that you find on the other ones, which makes it all the more interesting that we end on Violent Sun, which in my opinion is the best album closer they have hands down because before they they stumble a bit like white whale not my favorite song on a fever dream uh then there's fucking warm healer my least favorite song on get to heaven and you know the other ones are are fine but this is something this is this is don't try erasure i will not stand for it okay look good song it's not violent sun though the thing the reason this song is so great is because it plays in sharp contrast to the rest of the album and even their discography as a whole is it's a song filled with a strange amount of optimism and hope it's not devoid of darkness i'm sure tyler will have more to say about it in depth but i love how the song begins with a really weird and kind of tacky assembly of of synth lines and electronic hints and you're just kind of like the fuck is this and then immediately the first verse comes into play and it's just like oh okay this this fucking rules and it's just it's so it's such a catchy song too and it ends the album on a great note just like every time i finished it i feel feel cleansed i feel washed and i just think it's a really cohesive record i would put it firmly in the center of my everything everything ranking uh, below get to heaven but above arc just because I feel like this is if you took all the things I liked about Man Alive and all the things I liked about Ark and fused them you get this but it is something that still distinctly has its own voice and identity that has had me listening to it a whole lot these past two weeks so yeah I really really fucking like it no surprise there here comes the six out of ten (laughs) Uh, oh, uh, okay, so uh, yeah, uh, Reanimator, uh, yeah, Lost Powers, first song, pretty great opener, I think. Uh, maybe even it's uh, it's grown significantly on me, so it might might be one of my favorite openers of theirs. It's just a solid way to start that album in contrast to the other openers they've written it's much more it's much lower key it's not this large bombastic opening it's a bit slower and moodier and uh that yeah that being said even though it is those things it's got just the right amount of energy to just get you right into this album i think it agree does its job effectively and uh, Big Climb is also pretty great. I love the uh, hard-hitting environmental message uh, throughout this song to be very, very nice. I like uh, I liked this. Uh, yeah, liked it, but I did not did not find myself caring for the heavily auto-tuned vocals on the Big Climb Big Fall part where it's just distorted and auto-tuned and I sounded disgusting, didn't like how that was. But uh, not in, it's, it's not in a way where it like complements the song for like some kind of making a point about the disgusting things humans are doing to 
the environment. I, I don't know. It, it was odd. But the percussion on this song and this album, I think, is noticeably really fantastic. I think the drumming here is just great. It carries so many of the songs. Uh, then we get into It Was a Monstering, which I found just way too repetitive, especially when it goes into that long diatribe where they're naming off various monsters, the majority of which end with man. I mean, granted, there's definitely purpose to that, but uh, yeah, it and then they just repeat the main part of the song too much. It reminded me of my least favorite parts on A Fever Dream. Uh, and more than anything, I just find the worst tracks on this album really don't seem to progress in a particularly satisfying direction. The next two songs, uh, Planets and Moonlight, certainly come to mind. I mean, Planets spending its last two minutes just in this meandering nothing, which I didn't care for, and uh, Moonlight just feels like 45 seconds of a song looped for three minutes or whatever. However... I can't believe the man who, who gave a 10 out of 10 to the microphones in 2020 does not <laughs> seem to understand atmosphere. <laughs> well, I get it's for atmosphere. I just don't like the atmosphere. It's well, boring. consider that you're listening to it wrong. Consider my asshole. But I consider can't. the Consider the lobster. Mm, what are you talking me. about? Shut up. <laughs> you two. Shut up. I'm doing my thing. Uh, however... <laughs> Arch Enemy is, I think, one of the group's best songs in their entire catalog, full stop. It's, a, it's got a fantastic sense of humor with an amazing, like, weird story being told about this uh, man who is now turned to worshipping a fat berg in the sewers, hoping it will consume uh, all of humanity. Which, Hashtag Fatberg lore. Yeah, and it is, and there, and it's uh, got a, this nice thick, heavy instrumentation on top of it, with a very poppy tinge. I I quite loved what the band was doing here. It's uh, it evokes the best aspects of their sound across their whole discography. I think. Um. And it also ties a lot into back into Big Climb with this theme of wanting the environment to turn back and destroy humanity rather than just wanting to live on because wanting just things to get continually worse and worse. Of course, the uh, key line from Big Climb being, uh, we're not scared that it'll kill us, we're afraid that it won't, which also heavily relevant Ooh. to the themes of this album. Uh, Lord of the Trap Door is an okay song. That's about all I have to say about it. Tyler just... Uh, Black Hyena is also uh, an okay song. I don't have a lot to say about it. Uh, I, I did find the uh, Hello Reanimator part really corny. It's like they put that line in there just for all the everything, everything Stan accounts to put at last Hello Reanimator in their Twitter usernames. Aggressively adding. Uh, now, the reason I was mentioning the atmosphere not particularly working for me on a Planets and Moonlight is because it works in spades for me on In Birdsong, yeah. which is one of the most serene pieces on the album that builds and builds on itself to this fever pitch of a climax. And it really has this fantastic progression over five minutes. It's just beautiful to listen to. And it's kind of what I wish the other songs attempting for more of an atmospheric uh, oh, gosh excuse me <laughs> uh, it's what i wish they had gone for similarly uh the actor violent son is uh just uh 
I'm not a fan of violence, son, okay? God, why do you think... suck so much today? Oh my gosh, yeah, tell me about it. He just uh, doesn't enjoy fun, but that's fine. I don't. Uh, Violent Sun, I'm not a fan of it. It sounds like every... It's the same closer they've written for every dumbass album they've done. What the... Now you're just making shit up. Well, well, the the thing is that that could technically be right, because they haven't made any dumbass albums. They've made good albums. Mm. No, I'm... I, I don't like the direction the song takes. It feels like just... I I don't... I don't get what's... It feels just like some dumb pop song almost any group could have written. I don't feel everything, everything's name being attached to it makes much sense. I wouldn't have guessed they made it if I heard it. Outside of the context of this album... Oh, yeah, but overall, I think pacing here is very solid, and there's a lot of great material, but... uh, I don't know, just not enough of the material I like is is grouped consistently enough together or in a large enough quantity for me to like really adore this album. But the parts I do like on it are really significant highlights in the band's discography. So I do come away from this with a positive feeling. It's, uh, yeah. That's, that's what I have to say. Okay. Well, howdy. Captain. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Captain Howdy. Anyway. Reanimator by Everything <laughs> Everything. Sersha, you're not next in the acronym, I hate to say. Fuck me, I wanna off myself. <laughs> to quote Jake from earlier, I want a deep throat revolver. Yeah, uh, you just go ahead and do that then. I'll be right behind um, you. I, I need to end <clears> this <throat> anyway, so have fun. <laughs> Look. Look. I give August a lot of shit. Mostly because it's one of my favorite things to do in this life. <laughs> but also because I have strong feelings about this here record. Ooh, um, I gathered. Shut up. I'll just go <laughs> ahead and say that I, I don't like this as much as Get to Heaven or A Fever Dream. Uh, but I... They, I mean, two qualifiers there, one being it's not far behind at all, and another is that could change someday. Um, Yeah, I think from beginning to end, this is probably the most purely fun album they've made. Um, It's just like, even when it's not, you know, back-to-back bangers, it's still it's all it's always compelling and always interesting in a way that's not like sort of you know laborious i guess like like there there are plenty of spots on a fever dream that are just so emotionally intense that it can be a little bit daunting to listen to and get to heaven is such a smart record and there's so much to unpack that it's like you, you. I mean, you're obviously not gonna. That's not gonna damper the listening of it at all. But it, it's like digging into it is rewarding, but it takes some time and effort. And I'm not saying uh, digging into this wouldn't take time and effort, but it, parts of it have. I like. I don't want to say it's simpler, but I think my emotional reactions to it are a lot simpler than any of the albums before it. And that. I've at certainly at this point in time, um, and at this point in the band's trajectory, I found that really refreshing and sort of almost almost necessary. Um, because this is I can just pretty much throw this on whenever and listen to it front to back. I was listening to it I like I had finished up Violent Sun by the time I got the room in here. And not because I was like running late or anything, just because I wanted to. Um, Hell yeah. It's the, it's a lot of the most interesting musical sensibilities. Like I do feel like it's more sort of progressive, in obnoxious air quotes, than the last two albums. Um, 
but it feels to me it feels it feels less like man alive and arc fused as it does uh man alive and a fever dream fused also works and there's like there's still a, a strong focus on atmosphere and sort of building you know the 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 tone of things until it kind of blossoms into the big idea the climax of the song particularly on like planets and in bird song as already mentioned um the uh like the last two minutes of planets are maybe my favorite part of music this year it's just uh and like the la- I, but I could easily say the same for the last two minutes of in bird song. Um, Hell yeah! It's just euphoric and it tickles my brain real good. Um, I, I I don't have much in the way of complex thoughts on this album. It's just it makes the sounds that give me the serotonin. And it's it's interesting because I think. I tried to go into this with no expectations whatsoever and still I found it defying my expectations frequently in a way that I find really rewarding like especially on the opening the first time I listened to it I was you know expecting something with the grandeur of literally every single one of their openings up to this point in some way or another but this is a a more sort of laid back sort of uh, I don't even know how to describe it it's just more mid tempo and sort of it it's just a softer intro to one of their records than anything that's come before it and I really appreciated it especially on subsequent listens um but they do follow it up with one of those uh, classic bangers because Big Climb just fucking is slaps. It, it, <laughs> I mean, it's just horde. It's real good. Big um, Climb. Higgs is absolutely on fire here, both lyrically and in terms of performance. Um, it's like the the rapping on, if that's what you want to call it, on Distant Past, but sort of like that but more and i for one am a fan of that mindset um it's like sometimes less is more but yes if less is more just think about how much more more will be (laughs) that's like their ethos as a band um i find uh if i have a least favorite track it's probably it was a monstering um I think that's more of a pacing issue than anything. I find it comes at a sort of a weird spot on the album, but I also don't know where else it would go. Uh, Cause like the lost powers kind of starts it off, you know, about here and then it slowly goes up and then big climb takes that even higher. And then it, it was a monster and kind of goes back down a little bit. And it's like, big climb I, that led to a big fall. You might say, shut up. <laughs> wasn't a big fall (laughs) just anyway it's a good it's a good song i just have questions about the the structuring of it on the album i don't know um it's it it definitely threw me for a loop the first few listens but i've come to like it quite a bit since then um planets yes all of that again 20 (laughs) times um yeah Moonlight is positively gorgeous. It's again just purely tickles the brain the spots in my brain that are fun for me to 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 hear. It's real good. Um I was half listening to what was going on with Cersei there, so my brain just kinda went on autopilot. Anyway. What's next? Uh, Arch enemy. Oh yeah, Arch Enemy. Uh again. Flat banger it's i mean it's it's about a sentient fatberg that speaks to the protagonist in prophecy we've all been there right fellas 
Every day, man. Every day. Who's with Very me? true. Very good. Um, just, uh, is, uh, uh, I'm like, I'm <laughs> disgusted. I'm disgusted that they have the nerve to be this good again. Like, you get, <laughs> fuck off. I'm remembering Morgan saying that no reptiles is so good it makes him angry. Yeah. Here we Same are. Same energy. Yeah. Um, Lord of the Trap Door, sort of on a simpler musical sonic level as uh, it was a monstering, but I find it much more compelling than it was a monstering, even though I do like that song. Um, yeah, real strong stuff. Uh, Black Hyena, the at le- the opening at least would fit comfortably on like a Portis Head album. It just, I de- I I want everything everything to make a full blown trip hop album at this point. It's funny. God. I'm gonna just I don't want I didn't want to intrude, but I want to just comment real quickly on that comparison, as that actually I believe bassist Jeremy Pritchard said that his inspiration when laying down the bass for that song was Massive Attack. Well, another yeah, another trip hop band. That also makes sense, and it makes sense why it tickles my brain. It's real good. I uh, find the 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 title of the album refrain just a super satisfying like second act closer for the album. I guess you'd say in terms of structuring, but it feels like it's just a really grand moment in the album, and I like it quite a bit. Um, fuck is next? Oh, in Birdsong, in Birdsong, fucking gorgeous. It's yeah. Cosign everything every, everybody has said. <laughs> Go listen to it. Uh, the actor, just just one of their best songs. Uh, just proving that they may be the goat at penultimate tracks. Um, yeah. Just ugh. Ugh. <laughs> ugh. <laughs> That says more about how good that song is than like 5,000 words of Pitchfork I mean, you could. Truly. It's as good as a dead baby. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've got like a, a string of, like people comment on their openers, but you're, it's apt to point out their penultimates. You've got Tim, yeah. you've got The Peaks, you've got No Reptiles, you've got, I mean, New Deeps and Interludes, so let's count Ivory yeah. Tower as the penultimate track yeah. on Fever Dream just a string of, of fucking bangers there quality yeah and if uh, i kind of think of this as everything everything's uh speaking in tongues but it's better <gasps> produced um yeah. so it would be fitting that violent sun is there this must be the place because beautiful mm. beautiful i couldn't have seen it better yep uh, mm. <laughs> it's so joyous and resplendent and gorgeous and so totally everything everything suck it august yeah well you're not correct i know everyone disagrees with me but i don't care that's fair i suppose that's also fair fair. for morgan to kill you (laughs) that's Fair. I mean, you think this record's going to be at the top of his list is for reasons he's going to eventually slaughter me? I think it's going to be lower. Uh, August, I, if I was going to kill you, I would have done it by now. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's reassuring to know. Oh, I snorted. August, yeah. you should, you, August, I'm sure you can imagine like the, the grimace of anticipation on Morgan's face every time I was about to read out one of your Deftones reviews. <laughs> it was oh, like it's... bracing for <laughs> and, a bad and I will news. Say, I will say most of them turned out better than I was expecting. That's all right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. Anyway. Right. But Xerxes, uh, you said Xerxes was redundant on Saturday Night Ri- It's let's a good song, let, okay? Let's, let's it's a good song. That. Let's leave the baggage behind, folks. Yeah. Reanimator, real good. Okay. I feel very happy not having a horse in the Deftones race. Um, You've got a white pony. It just means you're missing out on an absurd Damn load of you great music. I've listened to I two quit. of their records now, and I think they're both good. 
We're not. This is yeah. We can talk. Anyway. We will get to do this shit in like two weeks' time. This is exactly true. Um, okay, so reanimator. I I hope it's my turn now. It is. Anyway, okay. it is. It is <laughs> you just have to. All you have to remember is the order of letters. <laughs> anyway, Jesus Christ. Right. Um, destroyed. Okay. L S T E R. Mother, I've taken L S T E R. So, Sersha. Okay. Um, I th- positives first. I'm going to try to go through and talk about this record in a way that isn't just track by track, um, but I might fall into that. Um, but positives first. I think this album has, across all of their records, some of their best, stickiest, and most complicated hooks. Um, just on a level of individual lines that stay in your head um this is some of their best and most complex songwriting um so, uh lines like i can't fucking find them now um and not afraid that it'll kill us we're just afraid that it won't that's one um also um permanently off my christmas list <laughs> um, there as well uh, this is so good. All I need is red blood. Um, I need my arch enemy. My enemy. I was lonely, lonely without you. On arch enemy. Right Shit like that. My arch enemy. <sighs> so good. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Um, and actually, the structuring of the chorus on arch enemy reminded me a lot of like some of the moodier th- places ABBA went. Um, That's which... such a cool comparison. Thank you. Um, And it makes sense for a band like Everything Everything, who seem to be equally interested in being complicated and ambitious and just making your ears sing. Um, Which is, I think, a way to approach this record. Um, I think Lost Powers is a a lovely, lovely little opener. Um, I wish, like... I wish we were talking about this in like five months or I'd had more time to digest this record so I could talk about the Crisis Kids line. Crisis Actors yeah, line. Yep. Because um, that's, a, that's a thing. Um, I think more than any other record, like mid-career Radiohead is all over this album. I, I was going to make that comparison when I talked about it and I don't know why I didn't. There's bass lines, I swear, are like right off of In Rainbows on this. And there are guitar lines that could be off like Kid A through Amnesiac. Um specifically was a monstering i would say yes um 100 i mean that's in a way there are some moments on the record where i i did want to be listening to in rainbows um but it's still a very good album i want to take that away from it but if i'm to talk about my real reaction to this record it gets into an area that's hard to unpack because as i talked about before some of the ways i react to music is incredibly individual and incredibly textural um like sometimes just the the feel of a record is if you were to put a the the a ball that was a record in my hands and i was and i would feel it um just because of completely random factors that texture either misses me or doesn't i talked about this a little bit with the jesse ware record um where it's just, and there is something about this record where just the vibe of it misses me a bit. Um, I still think it's a really good record. I think more songs are really good than not, but there are scant moments where I feel as exhilarated by it as I did some of the best songs on their other albums. Um, I think I think the song in Bird Song can can fuck with the best of them, um, but I think the rest of them are just very very good. Um, and I know in context it sounds like a criticism, but well, I think no, it's it, a really it, good it, record. Saying something is very very good is is just objectively not a negative. I, I know, but I feel like I'm saying they're merely very good. If you know what I mean. I mean, I'll take uh, it. <laughs> it's better than what August said. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair but i um i do think lord of the trapdoor i didn't like that song um uh and really i think there should go to jail I'm, I'm really sorry um but yeah songs like lord of the trapdoor black hyena sort of the actor it was a monstering just 
I, I struggle to remember. Um, and I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, Lord of the Trapdoor actually really reminded me of Hail to the Thief as an album specifically. Um, I have that in my notes. But I think, yeah, I am in the pro-Violet Sun camp as well. Um, I think that that's just uh, one of the most accessible closers. Um, I, I, I think it's everything, everything, just sort of letting their hair down after four albums of really tightly wound uh, yeah. music. Precisely. Which is, you know, they've earned it. <laughs> and I'll listen to it. Um, yeah, Arch Enemy, fantastic, fantastic song. Um, the solo is really great. Um, and it's got this uh, really moving and shifting feel to it. It keeps you on your toes. Um, Moonlight is another really fantastic song. Um, that is one song where I did get many sexes I found deeply satisfying. Sounded a lot like some of my favorite Muse songs as well, which I thought was interesting. Um, yeah, In Birdsong is just euphoric, absolutely euphoric. Um, and I think Big Climb and Planets really good i like the line in planets about like frat boys gatekeeping business um that was i mean that's not literally the word some paraphrasing but i thought that was excellent um Very yeah social line <laughs> yes, yeah, true. yeah. <laughs> I, I i do i will say i wasn't sure how you feel about this record but i did think you would like the songs planets and moonlight so i'm pleased to be correct there <laughs> um yeah um and i i love the haunting synthy but also warm 80s style intro to it um that total balance of hard line to walk so yeah overall i like the record it has some really good songs but when i think that every other album they've made is at least great even though I think this is very good, this is probably my least favorite Everything Everything record. But that is not a condemnation. It is a, a reserved recommendation. No, look, you don't have to feel bad about your opinions, or should like we we unless you're August and then we will mercilessly <laughs> mock you. I was until you die. Say, I, I'm, I'm expecting a joke at my expense. No, <laughs> no, I was schedule. gonna say, you know, uh, we do kind of like go after each other when and because it's funny to kind of like shit on someone when they like vary from your opinion like slightly. That's that's really mm -hmm. funny, I think. And we do that. Yeah. But ultimately at the end of the day, I think um, what works is that we do understand well, maybe like eighty percent of the time, we understand where the other person's coming <laughs> from, um, and, and like we can get it to a certain extent. Oh, wait um, to do the Fright and Rabbit episode, and someone's just like, "X album is mid," and I'm well, just like, "I don't understand you." I, I just, yeah, I, I will kill anyone who says that with my bare hands. I think that is why uh, August is not volunteered to be a part of that <laughs> episode. You know what? August is smart. Not gonna lie. <laughs> But but August, of course, should know that he's welcome if he wants to. But I, I, know, okay. I know he doesn't particularly want to because I know he doesn't feel that it's a band that would be for him. But if August, if you want to, the offer is there. I mean, I I am not against trying out an album of theirs, but I am also not guaranteeing that. Will May, work maybe it. not would, the the, de suggest, the Dressner one. Maybe not I would that one. Doing what I'm gonna do that would strapping young lad which is listen to an album and if i feel like i fuck with it then i might go on the episode might not yeah if you're gonna listen to one frightened rabbit album it's midnight organ fight midnight Absolutely. Yep. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's the one anyway um okay here so it is my review so this is the everything boy. everything boy this is interesting like i started out writing a review and it kind of very quickly just turned into an analysis um so i'm sorry in advance for analysis brain I hope that it's not too boring. I've tried to kind of like uh, make it cohesive, but at the same time, it, it's it's a bit messy. So I apologize for that. We've okay. all done this on this podcast at some point, so please do not feel bad. <laughs> Tallahassee. I mean, it's, yeah, um, it's, it, it's okay if it gets boring at any point. If it ever gets boring, I'll just yell at August some more. <laughs> sure. Um, but I'll, I wrote a lot of words like... I wrote a lot of words, so I'll try and get through it reasonably quickly. Um, but yeah, I have, suffice it to say, the TLDR, I have feelings about this mm. album specifically. And it's not I just have because, feelings. It's not just because oh, I'm an everything, everything, everything fan and I'm going to kind of, you know, jerk off to everything they do. Why did I say that? Everything, I, I, everything mm. they do. Yeah, everything, everything they do. It's because um, 
yeah, I feel the way I do. And for reasons that I hope will not only make sense, but like you'll be able to really understand where I'm coming from. And it might even give you a new perspective on the record um, that you feel like fits with you, even if you didn't quite gel with it like I did. Anyway. That's fine. I'm going to mute and then go and let my laptop charge a bit um, inside. Okay. okay. Um, so my journey with this album has been very strange and very long despite the fact that it's only been out for a week at the time that we record this uh, in the time that it's been out i've listened to it in full attentively more than a dozen times i've had it in the background many more times than that and i've listened to individual songs separately many times as well uh, as such you might think maybe if you're a bit of a cynic and you don't care for the record, that the love I've developed for it is maybe more akin to a Stockholm Syndrome experience, a case of familiarity and invested time compounding to create a feeling of obligated loving. Um, well, what I hope to do with what I've written uh, and what I'm going to say uh, is to not only thoroughly dissuade anyone of that notion, but also to make a case for Reanimator as everything, everything's greatest album yet. Oh my God. Um, yes. Uh, Reanimator is the Word. album that everything, everything have been working towards their entire career so far. It is the fullest and truest realization of who they are as a musical entity and specifically who John Higgs is as a writer and as a musician. And in terms of its thematic focuses and interests, it's the most fully formed, it's the most cohesive, and it is the most outward reaching record that Higgs has written to date. Uh, and that's not to do a disservice to the writing and the thematic structure of the other albums. Man Alive was kind of a maximalist odyssey through a wasteland future where human interests have become corroded by the integration of technology. Uh, Ark was a post-apocalyptic reflection on how humans reckon with having brought about their own self-destruction. Get to Heaven was an urgent attempt at understanding how a thoroughly mediatized world uh, barreling towards a fascistic future creates the conditions for people to realize their worst fears about themselves. And A Fever Dream was a despairing political screed that attempted to make sense of and find direction from living in a waking nightmare. Reanimator reflects elements of all of these albums funneled through a distinctly personalized lens that is more psychological than it is sociological. Uh, in a sense, it's Jonathan Higgs most autobiographical record yet, um, where previous albums doubtless reflect on how he feels about things going on around him here is where it seems to me that he borrows most deeply into who he is as a person and from the grains of the self-examination emerge more universal points about who we all are and how we all experience a world that is verging on apocalypse and the world that has been detailed on those previous four albums so basically, we've gone, we've, we've had four albums detailing that world and the relationship between people in that world. And here we have, um, well, a fever dream was this to an extent, but it's more direct here in terms of being a, an examination of, of one's personal experience of that world. More pointedly, though, where Reanimator differs most vitally is that it imagines a path through the chaos that we are not actually doomed by who we are and by the world and by the experience that we're born into that we can be our own reanimator that we in many different senses we can reanimate the world around us by actively working to improve it we can reanimate aspects of ourselves to realize the life that we want to live and we can reanimate an existence of being tired static and unmoved by life where a fever dream's white whale opined, never tell me that we can't go further. Reanimator not only confirms that we can, but it leads the way. And, and to be clear, this is not to say that by and large, it's an upbeat album. I mean, to be sure, 
The general topics that are covered on Reanimator include conspiracy theories, mental illness, climate change, the general cheery Higgsian interests. The difference here is that the band themselves are newly energized and ambitious in a way that they haven't been before. At least not quite like this. Get to Heaven's pristine and addictive layered pop is certainly energetic and ambitious in its own right, and that was appropriate because the darkness of the writing on that record was tinged with whimsy and satire. Here though, the writing is more jagged, cutting, direct, sometimes overwhelmingly emotional through and through. And so the instrumentation is less warm and more dynamic, messy, violent, and racked with tension. There are frequently jarring jumps from quiet to loud, as on Big Climb, or the decision to mix a bass drum with an abnormally large cavernous depth, as on In Birdsong, or a continual ratcheting of energy that burns brighter every time you think it's peaked, as we see on Lost Powers and Lord of the Trapdoor, or occasionally explosions of squelching, buzzing, feedback-laden guitar noise, as you get at the climaxes of Lost Powers and Arch Enemy. This is a record where the intense focus on psychological turmoil and the inner conflict between who you are, who you want to be, and who you are afraid that you'll become is reflected in arrangements that shift and slide and fall out from under you. It is a risky and bold decision to record something like this because it does limit the experiential appeal of your album. Most of the people I've spoken to who love it now didn't really feel that way the first time or even the first few times that they heard it because it deliberately wrong foots you in a way that their other records really don't. Where their first four records welcome you with their catchiest and most accomplished arrangements at, arrangements at the start, opening track Lost Powers is disorienting, nightmarish, full of bizarre conflict. It has these ringing and pretty major key guitar, guitar tones that give the track this swinging and bright feel, but then they clash with some of the darkest lyrics on the whole album, depicting a fall into the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and the experience of blinding paranoia that you can trust no one, not even your family and children, and even further, that violence might be necessary to save yourself and redeem them. The refrain of, come on, you've only lost your mind, is particularly unsettling, because rather than acting as a reassurance to our troubled protagonist from their intrusive dark thoughts, it instead serves to undermine them further by saying, actually, you have no control over your life anymore, you'll never again feel free, and that actually this is a good thing, because free will is evil, and the only true existence is in servitude. It's actually quite horrific the more you think about it. And, and this is complemented by an arrangement of crashing drums in guitar that gets more and more fierce as the song progresses to the final seconds of the song where everything is kind of melting together into a cacophony of noise before suddenly there's a click and silence. It's a choice to open your record like this. Uh, and, and I think that by cutting deep to the heart of the absolute worst that the world can do to you and slamming it at the front of the album, everything, everything have crafted their most definitive, unforgettable statement of purpose yet. Things can only get lighter from here. Second track, Big Climb, is perhaps the catchiest song on the record, but also very dark at its core, much like the opening track. It's ostensibly about climate change, and I want to take a moment here to comment on the lyricism on this album, which I genuinely believe to be John Higgs's most accomplished, refined, and affecting lyricism to date on any of their albums. Uh, in his typically charismatic and idiosyncratic way, he paints grotesque pictures of those in power. The lines, pink piggies with their hands on their ears, skeleton boy with the skeleton girl souvenir. And a great line which draws a link between general ignorance about climate change and the distractions and conspiracy theories fostered by those in power to actively progress the destruction of the earth. Ice flows quicken, drip feed, dripping in your eye socket under the hoax moon. We then get the song's hook, one of the darkest hooks on a pop single that you will ever hear. 
not afraid that it will kill us, yet we are afraid that it won't. The imagery gets even more dense, unsettling, and impressive in the song's second verse. The gas crawling like the ghost of the sea. Have you heard a more poetically devastating summation of climate devastation than that? And then in some of the best lines on the whole album, you can be a drone or the god killer bee. Drone in this instance having three different meanings, a bee that serves its queen reproductively by helping to continue the line, a mindless worker who shuts their mind off from the reality of their world, or an unpiloted aircraft that can be used to bomb countries remotely. And then the god killer bee being a running together wordplay of god killer and killer bee. God killer referring to people who usurp the influence and power of others to control the world to their own interests and killer bees being dangerous and violent in numbers, but also facing their own extinction at the hands of the same race who bred them. Um, thank you to the annotators on Genius for helping me to unpack that line because there's so much going on in just a small number of words. It's actually dizzying how dense this song is once you unpack it. And the wordplay, like I say, the wordplay is just out of this world. And then you get a series of lines so good that everything, everything had to put them on a billboard to publicize the album. The choice is to be a slave to the big time champagne cork in your windpipe and weigh a whole ton or be the curved glass in a desert full of sun are you burning we can burn it together but first we have to play god i hope you see what i mean here about the writing being dense and taking time to unpack but also being layered and meaningful in a way that really demonstrates john higgs at his best and the other elements of the song, too, are all pitched perfectly. It has those ringing guitars and talent from melody of all their best stuff, the huge dynamic range that hangs all over this record in particular, and so many great details that make it easy to listen to on repeat. I mean, listen to the tense and wiggling guitar melody that's introduced over the bridge of the song and gradually gets louder and louder before the final chorus explodes again. There's not a dull moment to be found here, and everything, everything take full advantage of their musical maximalist canvas. Now, another quite important detail that is worth mentioning at this point in terms of reanimator's concept. In fact, this is a pretty important lead that I've buried, uh, and it's that John Higgs was influenced deeply during the writing of this album by something called bicameral mind theory. I won't go into heaps of detail on it, but essentially the idea boils down to a hypothesis about how human beings developed and first experienced sentience. And one of the most interesting points raised is that when the first humans experienced sentience, this experience of having an inner voice representing their thoughts, that they interpreted it as some kind of higher power speaking to them or something external to them possessing them and that this was basically the root of religion. And the way that John ties this quite esoteric and obscure theory about humanity generally into the realm of the personal on Reanimator is in the way that the record repeatedly alludes to an inner conflict between two different voices within him. The part of him that reflects what he wants to be and his optimism for positive change in the world and the darker part of him that thinks cynically about everything and sees only destruction around them and the potential for destruction in their future. This inner conflict is at the heart of every single song on Reanimator. And this darker half of John even has a name that you can discover if you dig through the secrets on Get to Heaven. Thomas Silhouette. Shout out to Becky for uncovering <laughs> that and the rest of the, of the Everything Everything team. Um, so anyway, this sense of looking within yourself and seeing this malevolent and evil figure staring back at you, this Thomas silhouette trying to take control is reflected in the third song on the album. It was a monster ring. Now, ostensibly, uh, first of all, this is the biggest grower on the album, I think. Um, ostensibly it's a song about depression and about seeing your depression as this ugly and monstrous creature that is seizing control of you. Uh, it's immediately established tonally in the lines, I would rather have a friend than a good memory because memories and a yearning heart never held me close 
never helped me out. This sense of isolation, of loneliness, of fear of being on your own and unable to deal with that darker part of you that always lingers is all over the song. And it's so overwhelming that the chorus cuts to the heart of it with devastating simplicity. I don't like the feeling. No, I hate it. The narrator in the song is so overwhelmed by how unbearable it is to exist in their paralyzed, isolated state. And that's captured beautifully, I think, in the lines, it was a monstering at nearly 90,000 feet, or so they say, for I would not know, because I don't look back and I don't look forward. The theme of depression is some kind of inner beast that you're brawling with, or just negative feeling about yourself generally, being some kind of inner beast that you're brawling with, is made explicit in the song's bridge, which references a bunch of different fictional monsters and even ends with a touch of body horror in the lines, I want your head in my head alive. The most explicit reference in the song to the notion of your darkness or your trauma or your depression manifesting as an actual monster inside your brain, or alternatively, seeing yourself as having become some kind of monster. Shout out Metallica. The result of some kind of horrible mistake. Instrumentally, monstering is this strangely propulsive dirge ostensibly one of the more minimal songs on the album, but still loaded with driving instrumentation. The central guitar line in particular has evoked Radiohead for some, but for me reminds me very specifically of the guitar line in the song Sick by The Twilight Sad, uh, which actually deals with very similar themes to this song. Um, the song Planets is another slower track. Uh, this time it sees the band in a longing, ballad mode, but also curiously wrinkling that mode with rattling, ringing guitars, sizzling drum hits, and a minimal breakdown. Uh, I really can't sum up what the song is about better than John himself. Uh, quote, it's about calling out to be loved, feeling unworthy, and finding the love of the universe instead, unquote. In the verses, the song's protagonist reflects sarcastically on a world of bigots and bat caves, uh, and the upper class flaunting their privilege and excess, generally setting a mood of alienation from the world and a desire to literally escape it, to try your luck with the rest of the universe. Um, if Planets has any weakness, it may be that perhaps it doesn't quite click into place um, in terms of theme in the same way that the other tracks do, but it is still relevant and it does still um, sound great and it has grown on me. Uh, meanwhile, Moonlight is a ballad of a different kind, gently building from a core drum pattern and piano keys in an unconventional 5-8 time signature. It reflects on feeling as though your life is stagnant and that things are simply happening to you or not happening to you. Death and tragedy are vague outlines of possibility, as in the lines, 20 more seconds and it could have been me, lily-livered living in the Holocene way. And the an internal firestorm within you is dulled to a constant drone, as in the line, chaos, slow and warm. From this state of near catatonic depression, hope does emerge. For the first time on the whole album, as the narrator exults that all I need is red blood, a desire to regain consciousness and feel alive. And I'll get it, they say either vowing to move forward toward that vitality or convincing themselves if they could, if they weren't caught on the horns, stuck in their state of perpetual emptiness. What really elevates Moonlight, though, is the way that it blossoms musically as it goes on, till the, eventually at the very end it explodes, with John delivering an absolutely powerhouse vocal that I think is one of the most impressive vocal performances of his entire career so far. Um, I think to say that this song goes nowhere is to not really listen properly. Um, sorry, but I had to say that because I feel very passionately about it. Um, this explosion of feeling, of passion at the end of the song, suggests that there is hope to realize who you want to be. And more pointedly, that there is hope to bury the Thomas silhouette inside of you, the hollow man alluded to in Monstering. 
but that the narrator cannot do that until they stop saying, I'm here for good and start wrestling themselves free. To me, this struggle, this wanting to reanimate your life, but being bogged down in the difficulty of it, being caught in the horns, is such a relatable and perfectly pitched sentiment. It gets that self-improvement and self-destruction, or more broadly, that hope and chaos, are not these mutually exclusive states, but rather that life is a case of experiencing both at once, and just trying to get better at reconciling that experience as you get older. The record's second half kicks to life vibrantly with the bouncing beat of Arch Enemy, another song which provides a commentary on the climate crisis through a deeply sardonic lens. A fat berg is a congealed lump of waste and matter that accumulates in sewers and is imagined here as a metaphor for our careless trashing of the planet. The protagonist of the song serves as another template for Higgs's interest in the bicameral mind theory as this person interprets the voice in their head as that of a god, and in searching for its source, ultimately finds themself, themselves worshipping this fatberg, this product of human excess. It's Higgs's twisted way of saying, I think, that we take so much glee in polluting our planet through ignorance and laziness, that our pride would lead us not to be disgusted by what we've done, but proud of it, in awe of it, ready to sacrifice ourselves for it, and that we are ultimately no different from what we've created, so we may as well become absorbed into it. The climate narrative builds on the one established with Big Climb, as where that song targeted persons in power to hold them accountable for their damages, here Higgs considers personal responsibility, pushing us to evaluate what we are actually doing as a civilization to contribute to the state of things. The political is equally the personal for the first time, um, on an Everything Everything record. Instrumentally, the song was constructed to evoke the image of the army of fat depicted in the video marching down the street, and it has a sprightly beat that ultimately explodes in the song's final minute into a frenzy of manic guitar noise, a breathless and bizarre solo from guitarist Alex Robertshaw that sounds noisy and ugly and just absolutely rips. Uh, I want to co-sign Morgan and say that the incredibly underrated Lord of the Trapdoor uh, is such a sensational song. Uh, it's a spiritual sequel to A Fever Dream's standout track, Ivory Tower, and it is also about as explicitly political as Reanimator gets. Uh, following Arch Enemy's twisted sci-fi take on how human ignorance and complacency breeds physical destruction, Lord of the Trapdoor is a song about how ignorance at the interpersonal and cultural level breeds societal destruction, as well as inevitably self-destruction. There are reasonably explicit references in this song to neo-Nazism, as well as more specifically British staples of racism and xenophobia. The title itself specifically invokes this image of someone gleefully taking joy in hanging people from the gallows. And the lines one detonation and maybe they'll clap, pray to the blubber and drown them in fat, suggests that the bloodthirsty nature of such hatred can never be sated and will end as arch enemy depicted in a kind of self-perpetuating worship of destruction. The chorus of the song, I need her, only her, I need her, Armageddon, draws a line between the possessive desires of right-wing men for women and for violence. That possession itself is inherently violent in the context of people, and also suggesting that the inevitable result of our desire to possess or control others in one form or another will be the ultimate cause of our annihilation, our Armageddon. Musically, the song establishes tension from the outset and ratchets it up as it progresses with multiple fake-out ending moments where you have these subsequent explosive returns to the song that are likely intended to simulate the acts of violence that the lyrics suggest, the trapdoor falling away from the gallows. Around three minutes into the song, Alex gives one of the record's most incredible guitar solos, another blistering textural feat of beautiful noise that, if anything, is too short before you get the song's final violent push. 
Black Hyena is a bass-heavy rattling track that purrs menacingly as John invokes imagery of the creation of some kind of Frankenstein-like monster assembled from parts of animals, ostensibly an attack on hubris and the sense of species superiority that humans have, that feeling that you can act God in the sense that you can control others and mold them to your personal whims, and that all this will really do is invite tragedy, as in the lines, caught in the twist of delight, between this world and the light, the bones snap into place. You saw the face. You saw the face. I made the gravity mine. Black hyena gonna bite the idiot. Later in the song, bicameral mind theory is evoked again in the lines, on a banana peel, he slips and breaks his brain in two. The master cracks into life hinting again at the formation of the Thomas Silhouette character and our album's protagonist having their agency usurped by that darker side of themselves. This in turn suggests that the mad scientist character at the core of the song may even be Silhouette themselves and that the black hyena creature they're creating is actually a metaphor for their indulgences, their vices and their sins, assuming the form of a monster that ultimately seeks to destroy them. In Birdsong, the lead single for Reanimator is the track most heavily influenced by the bicameral mind theory, and it imagines the first moments of human sentience. It slowly patters to life like machinery powering up, simulating a new brain experiencing the world consciously for the first time. In the lines, crackling, the leaping of white fire, and spider-like, the dance shimmering and crawling over me. John poetically describes neurons firing in the brain as new connections are made and the world is perceived for the first time. Following this, we get the lines, Puppet man, a zombie lances from the blackness of my eye. I look into the God mouth, the energy, the energy in us. Lines which refer to that first perception of an inner voice, of hearing your own thoughts and feeling as though something must be speaking through you, possessing you, taking hold completely. Feeling like a stranger in your own body. A theme which the next song will elaborate on and the final song will resolve. Eventually, in Birdsong swells and pulses with the intensity of this feeling and the overwhelming inability of the central character to deal with the sudden presence of emotions, of feelings, of responses to a world that's clearly dying around them, as in the lines, the slaughter in the sky, a song that I cannot begin to understand. At its climax, the song tears at its own seams, threatening to break open before slowly receding again as though the central character collapses inward to retreat from the violence at the forefront of their perception. Deep breath. The actor is ostensibly a song in which the album's central character confronts the distance between themselves and that darker half, that Thomas silhouette that seems to take control and act for them, and to whom they are forced to surrender their agency. It's also a song which, for me, has developed a lot of personal significance as a non-binary person. Whether John intended it to or not, uh, the lyrics of this song reflect quite acutely what it feels like to experience uh, gender dysphoria. Um, quote, he fits my clothes and has a face like mine. If we act the same, then I don't mind, unquote. This sense of dissociating from the way that you physically present, having to inhabit this vessel, this secondary identity in your day-to-day -day life that clashes with the person you feel you are, such that you feel vacant and lost. Thomas Silhouette, in this instance then, to me, is a part of myself that recognizing is frightening because all it is is someone I once was and, and no longer feel like I am, at least not all the time. And, and yet he's the thing that I must always present, that must always come before me. I don't act, he is the actor, and I'm simply lost inside trying to man the controls. At the conclusion of the song, 
the narrator surrenders their codes to Thomas' silhouette, leaving Thomas with control of their body and escaping that form at last for good. I laid beside the landing strip, refers to watching Thomas escape with that form that they no longer want, finally being free from it, and finally stepping towards self-actualization. I felt another hand was opening, is the last new line of the song. As our narrator assumes a new form, a form they no longer feel trapped in, a form that is euphoric and, and beautiful and free. Uh, the dissociation captured in this song is reflected beautifully with the swirling vocal effects that disorient the listener, creating the sense of an inner voice that feels trapped and desperate, and then is eventually freed by the song's end. The euphoria for me that's hinted at with the escape at the end of the actor is fully realized in Violent Sun, uh, which is the most urgent and beautiful and I want to say necessary song of the band's entire career so far. John has mentioned multiple times that he considers this song the best song he's ever written and the best song the band have ever recorded and something that emerged fully formed, a crystalline perfect thing that to me is everything, everything. Uh, the opening lines and indeed nearly every line of, of all the verses begins with the word and, creating a feeling of constant forward motion that's mirrored by the propulsive speeding musical arrangement. The lyrics themselves are bittersweet and ecstatic and read like swirling thoughts behind shining eyes filled with tears of joy. In this perfect moment of ecstasy, which John has compared to sharing a final dance with someone at the end of the night, acutely aware that it will be all over soon, but having that thought energize you rather than depress you. This is the moment where, instead of getting caught up and lost in the gloom of their psychological turmoil, the album's central character is freed from it. Embracing the impermanence of things not as something to instill fear, but something to instill inspiration, passion, life, the Thomas silhouette, the darker half, that person who had taken over your form that you felt a great distance from, has finally departed, and as the previous song suggested. And we get confirmation of this with the line, you can barely make a silhouette out. Finally, they are free. And you know it has to happen tonight, and you feel it for the very first time. And she's saying that you don't always have to be a lunatic or an error or a prisoner of your terror. Who is she in this instance? Well, I mean, I, again, I'm not saying this is necessarily what John was going for. In fact, I don't think that it is, but you can still continue the trans subtext of the actor here if you want to, and you can interpret it as a physical manifestation of gender affirmation of being guided through your self-actualization by a representation of it, a new partner within you, who instead of being the negative force that was Thomas' silhouette, is something purer, uh, tied to you in only positive ways, a light inside you where there once was dark. Ultimately, to take the two pronouns that the song uses, you and her, are left dancing at the end of the night, intruded upon by the violent sun, the ever-present reminder of the morning to come. And instead of fleeing from it in terror, you say, no, fuck that. I want to be there when the wild wave comes for us. I want to be there. I'm where I need to be. At last, fucking finally, I'm home. I am reanimated. Yeah. That was exceptional. I also think that you have absolutely succeeded in getting me to view this album in a not entirely dissimilar way to that I already did, but definitely elaborating in a way that's going to make me further appreciate it down the road. But my, my, point is, my point is with that analysis is not that I'm saying this is definitely what everything's about. It's that I really mm. want the main takeaway here to highlight is that the writing is so good here that you could have so many different interpretations of what's going on, but it all kind of links together. Oh, uh, fucking really damn it. That was a way. good analysis. It's, that it's not good. that it does. It's oh. that it can. 
Yeah. I could listen mm, to yeah. Tyler discourse all fucking day. Yeah. Like, ah, oh. I look, I realized that it's, um, it's a hot take for me to say, this is the best everything, everything album. So I wanted to really justify why I felt that way. And I want to say also Absolutely. that it's not like the best by far and away. Um, uh, I mean, I didn't really feel this until like maybe a couple of days ago. Uh, mm-hmm. It was a, it was a, I listened to this album multiple times every day and it's been a slow journey with it. Every time I listen to it, I uncover a little bit more piece by piece by piece by piece. And now eventually I still don't really feel like I'm all the way there, but I, and it, there's definitely a lot of lines and, and subtext that I purposefully chose not to dissect for the sake of, you know, talking, not talking for fucking hours. But um, yeah, I, I think that this yeah. is such a rich album uh, and I think it's just, like I said, it's what it feels like they have been working towards in terms of improving every element of what they do. Uh, and for me, it just clicks here. Uh, in yeah. a really no, there are some people out there way. who would look at, there are some people out there who would look at that take and think you have only lost your mind. Um, and maybe, you know, <laughs> then maybe that's fair. Like, certainly I get, I get every perspective on this record. Like, for example, we're with Get to Heaven. I can't really understand anyone outright hating that record. Mm-hmm. I can understand people who rank this album pretty much anywhere in terms of the everything, everything ranking, because mm-hmm. it is like, it's a lot, you know, and it's not, <clears throat> and it's fair to say that it doesn't necessarily cohere for you because it may not. It's messy by design and that's a, a risk and it's, it's not necessarily something that's going to work for everyone, but I hope that all of you have come away from this thinking that um, there is a real depth to this record, uh, whether or not the sound of it works for you. Um, there's a real depth to it that it's a really uh, accomplished um, work and, and that they, they've done good. Uh, can I just no. comment on yeah. one aspect of your analysis, if that's okay? Please. Um, just what you were saying about the actor and dysphoria um, and the line about them dancing together at the end really reminds me of a line, in, and I mentioned it on the episode we did on the band, um, on a very, very early Against Me song um, called The Disco Before the Breakdown. Um, I don't know if any of you remember the note I had about this, but I'll say it again for those who weren't there. Um, there's a line in that song where Laura is saying, um, I know they're going to laugh at us if they see us holding hands like this. Um, and in Laura's autobiography, she says that she intended that line to be addressed to the idealized version of the woman that she wanted to be. Yeah. And I just think there's a lot of kinship with what you were saying about that line totally. in the actor. Yeah, and I mean, look, you don't have to read Reanimator through a uh, through the lens of dysphoria. What's so great about it is that you can read the psychological turmoil through the lens of pretty much any you know inner yeah. struggle that you have. There's Absolutely. always going to be different parts of you that are conflicting with each other, and that's basically what the record is about. Is about how do you how do you deal with that? How do you um, live with that? How do you process that? This is why. Everybody should listen to the Jams and Tea podcast. You get, yeah. you get yep. Tyler going on in depth, in detail, for God knows how many words, and you get me saying, ugh, ugh, <laughs> at and least both, 30 times. And I think both of those things convey the same feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. I don't know. I uh, certainly did enjoy the analysis, even if I don't see eye to eye with every point you made. Yeah, and I'm not trying to like um, change anyone's mind. I just yeah. want uh, it to be, you know, clear why I feel the way I do. No, there there are some uh, yeah some interesting ideas of what certain songs are about yeah. in there. And, and and I think um, the reason that line "You've only lost your mind" has become such a meme is because that's kind of like what the music of everything, everything at its best can feel like just um, yeah. an explosion of um, beautiful insanity. Yeah. Um, totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I yeah. guess that's, that's pretty that's much it. Record. I have a desire uh, to wrap up this segment. Yeah, me um, too. Me too. Me too. <laughs> uh, all right. We'll do the same thing we just did. Jams and tea order ratings and favorite tracks. Mm-hmm. All right, three favorite tracks are In Bird Song. Oh, God, this is tougher than I thought. Violent Sun, 
and Arch Enemy. I'll I'll, I'll be unoriginal because those are no, pretty why is it popular valid? picks. They're 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 just great songs. Uh, I give the album a strong eight out of ten. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, my favorite songs here would have to be Arch Enemy, Violent Sun, and uh, Lost Powers. Uh, my Did least you favorite just say me- you don't like Violent Sun? Did I say Violent Sun? Yeah. Yes, you I meant did. to say in Bird Song. Okay. That's uh, what I was going to say. How do you really like that one? I wasn't going to question it, to be honest, Morgan, but but sure. (laughs) Violent Sun's my least favorite. That's what I mean. If August said, my favorite's Violent Sun, my least favorite's Violent Sun. (laughs) The unparalleled chaoticism. If he's going to be wrong, he better be consistent. Yeah, well, (laughs) I had a Freudian slip there or something. I don't don't know. Uh, Six out of ten, I enjoyed it. Oh, I'll Eat. take that. Uh, my three favorites, and, and honestly, no particular order because this is, it's difficult to separate my feelings for them, but uh, I'm going to say uh, Planets, the Actor, and Violent Sun. Um, eh, my, my least favorite is... Probably it was a monstering, but like in the same way that Warm Healer is my least favorite on Get to Heaven. <laughs> um, it's, it's 10, 10, fuck it. Hell yeah, uh, let's, let's go. go. Let's go. I love it when Morgan gives 10s so it's, much. It's a, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a tentative 10, but it is an enthusiastic <laughs> one. A tentative 10 is a 10 on the list. Yeah, that's how numbers work. That, that so, sounds yeah. like a tongue twister there. A ten to ten is a ten on the left. Say that five times. I was going for that. Thank you, thank you, Sasha. Um, no awesome. Problem. Okay, good. Sasha. Okay, me. Um, three favorites: Arch Enemy, In Bird Song, and Violent Sun. Uh, least oh, favorite: yeah. gang. Lord of the Trap Door. <laughs> the gang with Jake is broken now. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <That's me. laughs> no worries. And I'm giving this a seven out of ten. Cool. Right. I, I'm a little sad that, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, none of you mentioned, I was going to say I was a little sad none of you mentioned Big Climb and your favorite tracks, but then again, it's not in my top three anyway, so I can't really say yeah. that. <laughs> um, we, only, we only get three, Tyler. I mean, I don't know what you want from me. Yeah, well, no, it's okay. Just, and this is a good album, so you know. I was like, just, yeah. um, I was just. It was my comfortable fourth. I was just japing. Um, my three favorite tracks. Japing? Japing. Yep. My. my uh, my three favorite tracks are uh, my favorite track on the record. I'll go from first to third because fuck it. My favorite track on the record is Lost Powers, actually, uh, which I think is uh, Hot Take, their best opening track, Fight Me. Um, not that there's no. not competition, but but I do think that. Uh, my second favorite track... I mean, track, you're wrong, but I won't fight you, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. Night of the Long Night, Stay Winning. Uh, uh, yeah, that's 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 their second best opener. Or, or to uh, the no, blade. it isn't. It's their worst. <laughs> Shut anyway. up! <laughs> wow. Anyway, 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 that's my favorite track. Barely, like you can. I'm picking at scabs here. My second favorite track is actually Moonlight. Um, and okay. my Good third movie. favorite track is uh, In Bird Song. Uh, uh, I don't really have a least favorite track. Um. I, you can say not available. It's fine. There are like a couple of tiny elements of two songs I don't quite love on the same level as the rest of the record, and that's kind of the la- the last part of Planets and the last part of Black Hyena. But I still love those songs overall, so I can't pick one as a least favorite really. Um, so I'm not gonna. Uh, but yeah, it's obviously a ten out of ten from me. Fuck. I want you all to know the last time we two of us or more, gave a new album a 10 out of 10 with Punisher. Phoebe? Yeah. 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 That makes sense. It, we it, have it, the ultimate Tyler Core album and the ultimate Jake Core album. Yeah, it's been nice to see that uh, we've been doing this for like 17 main episodes now, and we've still given like a, 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 a number of 10s uh, between yeah. us. So that's cool. Um, this this year of music's been pretty fucking good. Not gonna lie. Yeah, it has. Since have I given? I've only given Punisher uh, a ten for new albums. I think. 
I've got yes. two. Punisher and After Hours. One. Okay, um, we oh, need to oh, move. Let's move I, I mean on, on the pod, Jake. Like, I have oh. other albums from this year, I think, are tense. Let's move quickly along to um, our second album for today. Uh, the Infinitely Flaming... less interesting album. Okay. Uh, the Flaming Damn. Lips is American I'm hit. not saying it's worse. I'm just I mean, saying there's less to unpack. That, that's oh, fair. Yeah. You are so literally... I... Definitely You're literally saying, saying it's worse. worse. <laughs> 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 but that's only because uh, we just gave an album. We're coming out with a, with a hot take saying more that, more that the other album that isn't a 10 out of 10 is worse. <laughs> <laughs> real bold. Yeah. Uh, I don't so know. let's, some context. Again, I kind of feel obligated to do this because I think I've been a Lips fan for the longest. Um, yep. Actually, uh, this is really neither here nor there. I've told you guys this multiple times, but the earliest album I can remember listening to in full in terms of saying to my dad, that CD there that you just played, I want to play. I want you to play it again in full for me, please. Is Yashimi Battles the Pink Robots by this mm. band? Even Baby Tyler was just like on it with the taste. Well, it's not that like that was me exercising my taste. I think that was just where it began, um, mm-hmm. uh, to a certain extent, uh, and with a bunch, fantastic pick. and with a bunch of other kind of like dance records and shit that my dad also played. But anyway um yeah yashimi is this shimmering awesome album but i'm not even gonna get into it because we may or may not have an opportunity to discuss it in more detail uh in the future anyway uh but yeah anyway so flaming lips are a psychedelic rock band uh they have been around since the 80s and they released i think i don't know the exact number but i'm pretty sure it's more than 15 a shitload it's a lot approximately yeah. yes uh i am pleased to say i've heard every single one of them so i feel like i have an inf- a really informed take but what has been really surprising has been how into them a lot of you have gotten in the process of leading up to this which is i'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about um They're really this, all but one of us yeah this is 16 um, wow holy shit yeah exactly um so um <sighs> I know I've talked a lot, but is it all right if I go first this time? Because I went yeah, last go last time. Right. Do it. Okay. Live uh, your I, truth. I don't have like stunning insights to say about this record, but uh, I just want to get my shit out of the way because I wanted to segue from my intro. So, yeah, they 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 have not had the most um, iconic of decades in terms of like if you were to look at all the different decades they've been working. Um, uh, their last record was 2017's Oxymorty, and before that was um, 2013's The Terror. Uh, I went into those records. Actually, it was not the Oxymorty was not their last record. It was their last like? It was their last like proper studio album. Like they have like uh, like Sufjan does. They have like other albums they occasionally release. But I mean, King's the- Mouth was a studio album though. Wasn't yeah, I thought it was. Oh, okay. I, I guess yeah. then I'm a bit out of it then because I have not heard King's Mouth. But anyway. Mm, so you lied to us. You are well, not I, the expert you purport to be. I mean, look, listeners, does anyone out there agree with me that their last proper studio album was Oxymelody? If everyone disagrees with me, I will um, retract my statement. Anyway. But that, yeah, we are that's, definitely that's going to poem. get a wealth of feedback in the comments based on this question. That's his secret. He's just like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll admit I'm wrong if you all tell me. Cr- <laughs> comment section, <laughs> crickets. Um, anyway, so American Head has the same dense, lush, and layered production that Dave Fridman has always brought to the lips. He's been their longtime producer. I think he's been producing their records since the 90s, if not since even further back than that. Um, and if you know Dave Fridman's credits, uh, he is a very prolific producer who has worked with a oh, number yeah. of, 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 of really big name artists. The most controversial credits of which include um, Sleater Kinney's The Woods, which I think his production is amazing on. And the last yes. Bar- Baroness album, which I think his production is less than stellar. Just, just the worst thing. But what's interesting yeah, about sounds those... Sounds like a foot... What's interesting about those comparisons is that the production style on those two records is really not all that dissimilar. It's just that one that works and the other it doesn't. Um, um, but basically, what my point in bringing that up is that you, if you're familiar with his credits, you know that a lot of the music he does produce uh, does tend up to end, does tend to end up to a lesser or greater extent compressed. Uh, with the lips, however, that's never really been an issue because 
of the the way that they layer psychedelic, psychedelic elements in their music has often benefited from the intensity that that stacked mixing style brings to it. And I think this is most true on records like Embryonic and The Terror, which are deeply claustrophobic and uncomfortable by design. Mm. Uh, and as such, here, in an album that tries to capture the sense of overwhelming dread and wonder that tinged Wayne Coyne's childhood, it generally serves the album sometimes well sometimes not so well um again this is a record that has a unified concept and benefits from that but it's also a record that doesn't capitalize on its concept in um as interesting a way as some of their other ones do um opening track uh, will you return slash when you come down is i think the easy standout of the album uh, a gentle, Fantastic. dreamy soundscape with the strongest melodic core the band have had in over a decade, uh, topped off with a brilliant guitar solo from guest Mika Nelson, who incidentally is the son of Willie Nelson. Oh um, my god! Uh, so yeah, the son of Willie Nelson performs a guitar solo on a Flaming Lips record as such a Flaming Lips headline. <laughs> yep, sure is. <laughs> Not the last one on this album. Uh, then you get the uh, Casey Musgraves featuring Interlude. Oh watching the yeah. light bulbs glow, uh, which frankly doesn't leave much of an impression. Uh, I think it's the first moment on the record where the compression of Fredman's pr product production detracts from the overall sound. Sounds all right at first, then towards the end of the sound, you, you can just hear blatant crackling on the vocal that basically ruins it. Um, and it's not the first time that happens on the album either. Not the last time that happens on the album either, I should say. Uh, th this interlude, though, does lead nicely into Flowers of Neptune 6, which I think is another gentle highlight of the album. It effectively establishes the formula that most of the tracks on this album are going to adhere to. Slow moving, heavily atmospheric, but layered arrangements that kind of stagnate as they accumulate. Uh, in and of itself, a track like Mother I've Taken LSD. Love it. Pause for effect. <laughs> for example, is perfectly... Mother. LSD. Get my celebratory <laughs> diaper. <laughs> Mother I've Taken LSD is perfectly pleasant. It nails the atmosphere of wide-eyed adolescent fascination and that kind of first baby steps toward experimenting with drugs um, that the lips are going for and that they nail really nicely, I think, with the album cover. Um, but there are only so many times that we can listen to them dreamily mind this mood without also demanding actual songs to back it up. Uh, even when Wayne is getting deeply personal in his lyricism, as in the familial ode, Brother Eye, the song itself just sounds really flat and dull. What I wrote down specifically was all dressed up with nowhere to go. Uh, all that said, there is still... Boingo, boingo beat. All that said, there are still, I would so much rather be listening to Oingo Boingo than this. All that said, there are still highlights to be found here. And American Heat is by no means a bad album, even if a lot of the rapturous praise it's getting kind of bewilders me. Um, to me, I don't think it really sounds that different to the pop-infused psychedelia of 2017's Oxymelody, which I thought was a perfectly fine album. I actually like it even more than this one. But confusingly, everyone at the time treated it like it was offensively mediocre. I'm, and maybe that was just because there's a song that Miley Cyrus is on. But even that was surprisingly good. I, I'm not sure what has changed at this juncture in the Lips career. Perhaps following the tumultuous year of isolation that 2020 has been, the anxiety-laden, drug-induced stupor of what the Lips do feels more apropos now than it did in 2017. <laughs> Uh, but I don't really buy it. Uh, really, all this record has on its side relative to that one is a more unified and interesting concept, one that frankly is often more interesting to think about than the album is to listen to. Uh, though dappled with colorful piano stabs and flourishes, there's only so much cooing of you and me, thin sounding string arrangements and distorted guitar that I can take on a song like At The Movies On Quaaludes before it begins to remind me of why I've gone off a band like Tame Impala so dramatically in the last few years. I mean, that last album was very, very mid. I so. still like the first two Tame Impala albums, but this just makes me wish I were listening to them because they wrote songs. 
Um, and also, this album trails off in a really disheartening way. The last four tracks are just kind of one big slog that leaves no impression. And I listened to this album three hours ago and I can't remember what any of the last four songs sound like. And I've heard this album three times now. So yeah, look, the lips are seasoned musicians at this point and they're going to create dreamy and pleasant soundscapes uh, in their sleep. Like it's not hard for them to do that. And it's like, okay, we get it. You can do that easily. Uh, you just have to, on your 16th album, you have to be pushing a little bit more. You have to be writing songs a little bit more. Like if this concept, this like idea of, of diff- dipping into Wayne's childhood and his anxiety about his brother's relationship with drugs and then his relationship with drugs, if that kind of concept that the songs all kind of dip into, if that was infused with the songwriting of something like Yashimi, this could be like one of their best albums but it's just not it's just mm. it just it kind of um somnambulant and um vaguely present when it's on okay I, i'd like to go next if that's okay well so, that is. I'm, I'm just i'm going to be very quick and in a very similar vein to tyler mm-hmm. so um I'll, I'll let you two bicker whoever wants to go next yeah, I mean, you can go. That's fine. Oh, okay. Um, it's like a slight. This, 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 this is a fine album. <laughs> it's fine. It's never unpleasant to listen to. Occasionally, I wished it was unpleasant to listen to. <laughs> and I'd have something to latch on to. <laughs> but this is just so thoroughly disinteresting to me and I definitely second Tyler's complaint that there are only so many times that I can hear someone uh, sing about being high with someone and this is, <laughs> this is the only Flaming Lips album I have heard so oh, that's tragic it, yeah, is. it is well that'll, that'll change soon enough Look, they have done 16 albums. This is like bottom three material for me. Cool. Uh, I just, I was, I was going to listen to Yoshimi and then I ran myself out of time. It happens. But uh, yeah, this is, a, it's, it's, it's fine. Okay. So sure. Okay. So, um, in prep for this, I listened to three Flaming Lips records. I listened to, first of all, the Soft Bulletin, which I liked a bunch. Um, the last one was Yashimi, which I liked a, a lot more. And my favorite was Embryonic, which was my favorite so far. Um, Tyler is correct that it is a much more claustrophobic, much more aggressive record, much heavier than some of their other records. Um, and this is not that um for me uh the the attraction to this record is that it is a total sonic counterpoint to embryonic in really uh pushing a line in these just immaculate soundscapes um we have had moments before on the pod where storied bands uh releasing a new record and we're like, well, we should, this band, we should talk about them. I would cite the Lamb of God and Nas here. Um, and then it's just kind of mid, um, mid to bad, you know. Um, and, you know, I liked the Lamb of God record, but I know you guys didn't. So I was ready, embracing for this to just be, well, I guess what Tyler and Morgan think it is, which is a band sort of cruising and just doing what they do. Um, but I ended up, really 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 enjoying it um it out of the four it is probably the least good but i still rather enjoyed it quite a bit i was bracing um, you for you just then to say that it, out of the four it was your favorite and i was gonna no i know i know no. I know, I know, I know. But like just yeah i was just thinking that for a second and it was really funny it's fine no like i don't know i was listening uh to us on a very long car journey today and Ah, uh, God, I'm, it's like, I think 50 minutes long and it doesn't really 
divert its sound that much, aside from one of the interludes towards the end. Um, but just that feeling of just sitting in this really beautiful space is, is you know, something I will happily do for 50 minutes. Um, and along the way, there are some songs that I really, really like um, and enjoy spending time with the characters of. I know we've thrown some shade at, at the movies on Quaaludes, but um, I vibe with it quite significantly, as I do for pretty much the whole run up until you and me selling weed, um, which I I find that closing track, you and me selling weed, just to be a, a very charming and sweet tale about two people dealing drugs together. Um, it does. It's it's like if um, living on a prayer was good. Um, <laughs> you just have these two. I'm always characters. happy to see Bon Jovi shade. <laughs> yeah, I, I am too, but I'm just, I'm still trying to connect the two. Well, it's the story. It's the story of these sort of two people who are living sort of rough and sort of wild and money and like a paycheck to paycheck, as it were, as a drug dealer. And you see the the um, downfalls of their life and the upswings of their life as well along the way. And the attraction is just being with these two people you care about, even though I don't care about the people in the Bon Jovi song, an iota. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. You're just, you're adding way more detail than is in Living on a Prayer. I actually know <laughs> what she's talking about because I probably have listened to that song a bit more than uh, other people here because of uh, one of my parents really liking that stupid fucking album. <laughs> but... No, she's she's not unfounded there. Thank you. And yeah, I, no, I, I, I get yeah. it now, but I just yeah, that's fair. And also, I enjoy Mother. I've taken LSD a lot. Um, as someone whose life was almost completely ruined by my mother finding out that I'd, I'd been doing drugs, um, there was something almost very relatable to the song, and sort of some of the lyrics about how how drugs can seriously fuck up your life. Um, um, and partners strangely well with one of the other tracks, um, Mother Don't Be Sad. I think that Mother Please Don't Be Sad. I think yeah. I wish that those two tracks were next to each other. So it would just be such an obvious comparison. Um, no, and I enjoy that song a lot. Um, I even enjoy the interlude with Casey Musgraves. I, that might just be because it's Casey Musgraves. I don't know. Good voice. Um, but she's on the track and I enjoy it. I also like the Close of My Religion is You a lot. Um, all in all, this is a record full of sweet, lyrically sweet, characterfully sweet, and the characters in the songs are just like, I like spending time with them. I think their relationships are cute, and just spending it in this hazy, dreamy, nostalgic air of like sinking into a really warm armchair on some really good uppers. Um, it's just really worth having and i know that the flaming lips can do this in their sleep but they still did it and it's like i don't care if like they like you say a band can make really good music in their sleep i i want that really good music um whereas they did I, this album and i sleep <laughs> <laughs> i no, sleep i have had probably more than other people on this podcast problems with albums running together not really being able to distinguish songs from each other I don't know why, but that's true of this record, and I don't care. Fair enough. Like, um, yeah, I will, like, I'll give this record credit. Like, there's a focus to what the songs are about. I just think that the writing itself um, could have done a bit, could have used a bit more uh, energy and work. But I get, I get yeah. where you're coming from totally. That's, that's fair enough. That's good. I will piggyback off of Sersha because, uh, like the Lamb of God review, which I anticipated this being, more or less exactly <laughs> like just with a little less extremity i guess on both sides but oh this is so here, much this is so much so much yeah. better than the you look here, this, is God my, this is my vinyl of the terror which is my favorite flaming lips record and i have listened to um like all of the canonical like the 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 highest rated records of theirs now um and i will say uh american head is pretty comfortably the 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 least good of all of them uh that said the thing is with all those other albums is that they're really fucking good so saying that it's the least good 
is really it, it's it's not mm. by much. It's like what I was saying with everything, everything with um, yeah. With and in a way, I I think this is uh, a. I, I mean, I it's not like I don't. I, I definitely understand the reactions to it. That said, I just found this remarkably easy to keep coming back to. And the reason I, I point out that I like the terror so much is because. This album is an album that is not meant to be listened to on a song-by-song -song basis. It's really more about the singular movement of the album. It's why the digital track list has, like, the individual songs and then, like, a compilation of them at the end, which is fucking stupid. But it's there, is what I'm saying. And yeah, the, the Spotify thing... version of the Tira is fucked because it, it cuts parts yeah. out of the songs as well. Which is so stupid. Yeah, I had to do some fun uh, digging on um, Soul Seek to to get an, a version of the album that uh, I, I, I could, didn't. Could, could you get... possibly hit me up with that version? I absolutely okay. can. I will give you a file on Google Drive later. Here we go Thank condoning you. piracy in a public forum. Great. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't. I definitely do that okay. as well. Okay, but the terror I think is a good point of comparison here because it is definitely this album's mirror image. It is. It has embryonics claustrophobic and well embryonic is a claustrophobic and confrontational record but the terror is an oppressive record it is a record that seeps inside you uh and this album has the same sonic approach and that i feel like it's it's definitely more has like a fully formed song for each individual track but i would never like i go back to yoshimi sometimes to listen to the whole album or i'll just bop to do you realize which is the fucking best song i've ever fucking heard in my life but then I, i'll come back to this and it's just like i don't really want to listen to any of these individually i'll just kind of play the whole album and that's true for some records more than most uh but i just i like the the openness of it. it is a gorgeous sounding record and all of the trademarks of the band that I like that give them a personality show up here. The very cheeky songwriting, but also as Sarah just said, there's occasional moments of genuine vulnerability and, and heartwarmingness and this sort of backdrop of suburban America. And I also think like the record I think too is kind of political in a way where it's sort of using this drug-addled haze to get away from all of these problems that probably like caused Wayne so much anxiety but also feel kind of relevant now and even in the title American Head it's just sort of like we live in such a fucking hellscape and um, like music like this serves the purpose that the drugs serve in the narrative of the record for the characters and and i like that sort of parallel that it has going on and i just think that the i like the vocal performances a lot um wayne is not the greatest vocalist on earth he's incredibly hit or miss in fact i think um oh, but I love his vocals i love his vocal delivery so much it's, it's just that, so that, it, it's nice. an acquired taste and oh, I love friendly it too. i love it too yeah, so, yeah. it's it it can be like it can be the most beautiful thing you've ever heard and it can also be awkward and it takes getting used to but here i think it is very well integrated with the songs very well layered um i love uh, as Tyler said, I think the intro is probably my favorite song just because I love the 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 glitziness of the instrumental, but also just the repeated refrain of it's just it's so catchy. Um, and yeah, if you're looking for something that's a little bit more direct, if you're looking for the soft bulletin, if you're looking for Yoshimi, if you're looking for War with the Mystics, you're not going to get it. Or Cloud's Taste Metallic. It's like this is very distinctly more leaning to the psychedelic and dream pop elements of their sound, whereas the other elements definitely lean way more into the rock part, whereas the rock here is basically not present. Uh, but as someone who really fucks with psychedelic music, I just really like it. It is a, a very satisfying, cohesive listen. Um, I know we've dissed a little bit uh, at the movies on Quaaludes, but I just, I love the production on that song. It sounds so fucking good. Um, I, I also love You and Me, Sel and We, just because I think it's charming. I think it's a very well-written 
track. All of the songs have a very, uh, they serve a definitive emotional purpose, I find. There's a lot of darkness that's shrouded on this record, like on the song Assassins of Youth, which is a super dark song that wouldn't really be out of place on the terror. That's about this, you know, this sense of fleeting childhood embodied by the titular Assassins of Youth, sort of like a, a, a metaphor for, for time and getting older. And uh, I do love Casey Musgrave's contribution to the penultimate track, and My Religion Is You sort of serving as the, the final closer of the, the, the finding the solace, the, the narrative arcs c- converging here. Not that it's like you have to pay attention super close, but like the real appeal of this record is just if you want to sit back and then just lay in your bed and you just kind of want to drift away, this is good shit. It's not the best shit for this. <laughs> you know, this isn't, you know, it's not like, it's not fucking The Verve. It's not, you know, it's not some of their other records, but it does suit a distinct purpose in their discography and that I haven't heard them lean this far into this pocket of their sound. And I appreciated that it's here and I think it's really, really well done even if it doesn't have the narrative ambition as something like Yoshimi or At War with the Mystics, or if it doesn't have the immediacy of something like Soft Bulletin or even Embryonic, but I highly enjoy it, and I would anticipate seeing this decently high on my end of the year list, just because I have listened to it over and over again a lot, and I really haven't worn myself out on it slightly. I'm listening to all of their records pretty frequently, just because I'm super into them now. Uh, but I, I just, I really, really like this one. It's, it's yeah, quite I, good. I can't remember who it was, but someone said, um, I'm glad to see that the family lips have dropped um, any narrative pretenses and have just made a record. That was me. <laughs> I've just made a record about doing drugs. And yeah. uh, I think that's why I like it so much. Exactly. Precisely. It's simple. Yeah. Oh. Uh, All right. August. Yeah, I don't have much to say. I'm pretty much in line with the uh, Tyler and Morgan, it's it's the band on autopilot. They're just like, yeah, I mean, they're at the point in their career where they've made so many culturally significant records, they just don't have to give a shit anymore and it's gonna sell. And not that that's really a slight against them because I still do enjoy this record, it's just... I don't know, I'd never see myself returning to this for much of any purpose. There's some nice moments on it, but I'd just rather have that ambition that the other records provide, frankly. It's got some neat moments, but uh, yeah, maybe I'd return to those, but I don't know. When it's 50 minutes of like... Will you uh, return, August? When you come down... (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. So favorite tracks and ratings. <laughs> yeah. What well, okay. Sure. Oh, so that's sure. that then. Yep. Sure August, is. August, do you want to go first? Me? Uh, okay. Uh, I'll another one. <laughs> okay, let him go first. Let uh Thomas Shadow or whatever the fuck go first. Uh <laughs> Uh, favorite tracks are uh, Shadow, <laughs> Brother, Brother, I, um, I guess uh, Mother, I've done LSD, Mother, I've taken LSD, whatever the hell it's called. I don't look up track lists because I can't remember the name of these fucking songs. American Hard. <laughs> I don't know. You think I know the name? Uh, uh, yeah. No, no, it's, you're right. I'm the same in the same boat. I My favorite up. track called "Just Flavor the Lips" album is uh, "You and Me Selling Quaaludes in LS." <laughs> mother, mother, please don't be sad. And uh, my least favorite would be, uh, I guess, uh, "God and the Policeman" for no other reason than. Uh, uh, Casey Musgraves is on it, and she uh, and she is uh, R. Kelly's wife. 
Not any fucking more. She's not. <laughs> she was our Kelly's wife. How about? Okay. Um, Did you write it? Rachel. August said his favorite his favorite song was Dinosaurs on Quaaludes at the movies selling weed. Uh, to my mother. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I guess it's a 6 out of 10. That's sure. about what I'd give it. Who's next? Any given day, I'm a 6 of 10. Jake, I'm going to go next. You sure. Uh, I really like Will You Return When You Come Down. Um... You and me selling weed, and mother, please don't be sad. I'll say my least favorite is probably (sighs) When We Die When We're High. I still like that song. Uh, And I give the album an eight. Nice. Trisha. Yeah, all right. So my favorite tracks are You and Me Selling Weed, um... Mother by Bong Joon Ho of Taken LSD. Um, and let's that was, say. Mm, that was a reach. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, let's say my. I prefer Mother by Darren Aronofsky of Taken LSD, personally. Yeah, and uh, let's say My Religion Is You, and my uh. least favorite track well, was um, When We Die When We're High. And I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10. Okay, you got that much? Yeah. Definitely stop talking just to listen there. Um, <laughs> I knew it. This, this is being um, edited out, by the way. Um, it's not. Bit. <laughs> bit. Uh, my, three, my three favorite tracks are. Uh, Will You Return When You Come Down, Flowers of Neptune 6, and Mother Please Don't Be So Sad. My least favorite track is Brother I've Taken Quaaludes at the Movies. No, seriously, my least favorite track is Assassins of Youth. It's a wet turd. I don't remember what it sounds like, but that's what I wrote down. Um, And I give this album 5 out of 10. Oof. Only because I've spent so much time with the lips and I just know they can do better. No, no, it's fine. I get it. It's chill. What about Morgan? Who's going to give this a six? Uh, well, uh, my favorite tracks are uh, Mother, Please Don't Be Sad, uh, the first <coughs> song, or whatever it's called. When you return, <laughs> when you come down. Sure. Mother, mother please don't take LSD. Jesus yeah. fucking Christ, Mom, to stay off the fucking pills. <laughs> oh. Oh. Mom's on Got the quaaludes again. <laughs> oh, Mom, take your fucking the quaaludes. antipsychotics again. Jesus it, Christ. It's, it's the quaalude scene from the Wolf of Wall Street, but it's... Give me those um, yeah. fucking loads! <laughs> a really good impersonation. <laughs> Ankle front. I'm going to just say the one with Casey Musgraves. Who cares? And uh, the, my least favorite is the one about quaaludes. Um, five and a half. Sick. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, on that note, um, that concludes our main segment of our um, album reviews this week. Uh, next week on our main, on our kind of central it's, it's new release reviews. Uh, we're, we'll get to the recommendation yes, but next yeah, week yeah. on our um, new release reviews we're going to be reviewing the new Napalm Death album uh, Throws in the Joy of the Jaws of Defeat and the new Knuckle Puck album 2020 uh, unless anything better comes along but I'm sure they're, they're decent records <laughs> uh, I'm just not familiar with either artist well I'm vaguely familiar Con- with Kanye Death. being surprised dropping Donda 3 Return of the Donda <laughs> <laughs> well, you forget, Jake, that if that happened, it would have to be the following week if we discussed it at all. Um, Act. Anyway, yes, please stay tuned for those. But let us know in the meantime what do you think of the albums we discussed today? Uh, Everything, Everything's Reanimator and The Flaming Lips is American Head. Please let us know down below what you think. Uh, I'm very curious if any EE fans have any thoughts on what I said about the album or what anyone said, but like, I'm particularly keen to get feedback so you can either leave that in a comment or hit me up on twitter which is also in the description uh and Mm -hmm. yeah thank you for watching and uh we're in our 
if you want to jump over now to our record club review, we're going to be reviewing a choice of mine, which is XTC's English Settlement. And next week on our record club review, we're going to be reviewing Swans's The Glowing Man. So yeah. You can look forward to that as well. But and in the meantime, I have a question to plug. Thick, Please plug away. Because we have not plugged it on a main episode yet. We have a uh, review from me of uh, McDonald's uh, Travis oh, Scott. Yeah, burger. yeah. Please go watch this video. Um, it's on please, this channel. Please do. Per- it's perhaps on this channel. the greatest thing this podcast has produced. Not to belittle any of you, but okay. just. No, fair enough. August review um, of the Travis Scott yeah. burger is a, is a yeah. work of high I just remind you guys to check out my EP on Bandcamp. Yes. It should be on Spotify by the next time we record. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and Jake's book as well. Yeah. All right. So Rock with all London. that being said, rock over London, rock on Chicago, uh, Geico. Uh, so easy, a caveman can do it. <laughs> <laughs>